I think it's important to know when it's time to update your software and update your routine and maybe make it less rigid after a while. What am I doing to just jam pack my time so I don't have to sit with the fact that I'm slowly dying? <laughs> There's something so soothing about knowing that it's true and it's succinct and I can repeat it to something else and my brain can't overcomplicate it. I have to surrender to it. Having this sensitivity to audio is like a, a weird sort of almost disability, especially in today's world that I don't think we talk about. I think that it maybe was is my fault too because I talk openly about having misophonia. What is that? Which is kind of when you hear noises very loudly, mm -hmm. which is part of, you know, you also hone it being a stand-up. You know, I can hear yeah. a candy sure. wrapper open. I can hear someone, the difference between a laugh and a, a fake clap and a real clap. You know, I can hear when people are getting up, all that kind of stuff. And some of it they say is genetic, also could be from um, growing up in a like an alcoholic home, like developing that hypervigilance, like needing to always sort of like, you know, have your ear to the floor type of thing. And so I talk about that and um, like people chewing, loud chewing, that kind of stuff. So I think I probably get a lot of people that are like that. And then I right. go ahead and betray their trust by having people eat on the podcast. Yeah, well, it's like you're eating next to a highly sensitive microphone. It's like the most disgusting sound. It is you pretty can gross. And I mean, but some people like it. I feel like ASMR, is that what it was called? Yeah. Had a big moment. Yeah, I think people are into that. Yeah, but it was pretty gross. Yeah, have you seen there's like a video where this lady she like goes around and she just like touches things on a very expensive car. <laughs> and then and then, and then it's, <laughs> it's just, it actually sounds very nice. Soothing? Yeah, or you just realize like, oh, there's a reason this car costs $300,000, that all Ooh. the different things are of a higher quality. I wonder if there's some kind of association based on your ancestral lineage slash trauma slash genetics, epigenetics of the sounds you find soothing and mm -hmm. where you're from. Like tearing paper is soothing to me. Right, unless maybe you have some sort of traumatic memory associated with something like paper that. Paper cut or something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but like I just like the tearing of the paper. The other, the whispering doesn't do anything for me. I guess I do like it when people whisper a tiny bit. Like NPR voice? Um, not Terry Gross. Yeah. I don't find her particularly soothing. <laughs> um, but yeah, kind of. Sometimes. I wonder, there's got to be some kind of association for why we enjoy some sounds and don't. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. I don't know. You good? That's for a smarter guest. Yes. Smart. <laughs> I don't think anyone cares. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I was supposed to do your podcast in LA. Yes, and then you couldn't. And you, I remember you being like, it seemed like it was extremely difficult for you to reschedule something. I take other people's time very seriously, and especially when it's people I look up to and respect. And I was so honored that you said yes wow. in the first place. And I just, I think I have this thing in my head where I like think. People already think I'm like an LA asshole. Oh, sure. And like rescheduling is just like a flaky thing to do. Yeah. But I also think that when you're too unctuous and apologetic when you do reschedule, that's annoying. Sure. No, I what yeah, I wondered if it was hard for you to like you were you were like, I'm not feeling well. I had this thing, this medical thing I have to do. And I was like, say no more. Like, it, uh, who cares? Mm -hmm. But it seemed like it was very hard for you to not do something, even though you were putting your health first. I was like admitting I had a human limitation. Is that what and it was? And that's embarrassing. Huh. Yeah, that's a little embarrassing to me. And I think there's also with you, I've wanted to have you on for so long. You're not in town that often. You know, I, I am able to reschedule pretty yeah. easily with people that live in town. Sure. But I do like... I'm in Austin for a week. I've spent the last two weeks putting my schedule together and routing stuff and that whole kind of thing. Sure. So in my brain, I'm like, well, he could have scheduled something else and this and this. Right. So and we didn't we don't really know each other yet. So yeah. I was probably a little more apologetic with you than I normally would have been with other people. Well, the sick thing is interesting to me because it's like and COVID brought it to the forefront where it's like, if you're sick, you should not do stuff. That's but we true. have this kind of like, oh, well, I'll power through mm -hmm. because it would be rude not to. And it's like, no, it's like, I, I was supposed to go hunting with someone on Sunday morning and he canceled at the last minute and he was like, I'm not feeling well. Yeah. I took a COVID test. I know it's not COVID, but he was like, I know you have kids and I know you travel a lot, yep. so I'm just not going to do it. And I was like, 
He was like, please don't be mad. And I was like, be mad? This is like the nicest thing yes. anyone has done for me in some time. Like I was yes. like, I wish everyone was like you. And especially with like having a conversation with you where I'd want to be on point and, you know, sure. be sharp. Like if you're sick or distracted or I'll cancel these days when I'm tired. Yeah. Because sure. I'm like, right now I have to show up with my brain being 100%. People are going to be listening to this. They expect it to be smart and interesting. If I'm even at 99%, let's reschedule. Right. You know, so I'm normally pretty good about it because I just think about the product. And I'm like, if I'm forcing myself to do something and I'm on Sudafed and I'm tired and I'm distracted, like it's not going to be a good podcast. But see, I've been thinking about that because part of life is pushing through when you don't want to do something mm -hmm. and when it doesn't feel like it's coming. Right. You have to like yes. develop this sort of tenacity, this stick to itness. And, you know, you have these days where like it, you the resistance is telling you don't do it yep. and you have to push through. Yep. And then you have these other days where you're sick or you're tired or you're just not at 100%. Mm -hmm. And what is the lot like what is the line between you're pushing through for the right reasons or you're not doing it for the right reasons? Can you I know give you I mean? a dumber example? Yeah. Not being able to tell someone you need to get up and pee. Yes. Because like I'm thinking about something else. I have to pee. Yeah. I'm all of a sudden suboptimal. And what am I embarrassed that I'm human? <laughs> yeah. Like we've been sitting here for two hours. May I get up and use the restroom real quick? Like right. that's a harder thing for me to do. Being sick, I kind of am a little more clear on it now. Like I've sort of figured that stuff out. But I mean, I remember I went to a Workaholics Anonymous meeting once. Everyone was late. Yeah. <laughs> By like 40 minutes, <laughs> everyone rushed in and we all got in trouble because it was a lot of sort of successful people yeah. and, you know, where I live and everyone was like, hey, love your work. And yeah. they're like, you can't say that here. You know, that's like saying you're so entertaining when you drink. Sure. Right. Yeah. And one woman's bottom line was I will get up and go to the bathroom when I need to pee. And I used to I used to sit at my computer and think I had achieved something because I had to pee. Yes. Like I would kind of like see how far I, it was like edging or something. I could, yeah, I wanted to see how sure. far I could take it. And mm -hmm. it was like, why I'm thinking about something else, which means I'm not hundred percent focused on this, which means this has nothing to do about the, with the work. Yes. This is some like self-depriving masochistic false sense of um, pain and gain yeah. that is not yielding the best work. Right. No, it took that, me a long a time, really like on Rogan, point. to go, hey, can I get up and pee? We've been here for four and a half hours. It'd be weird if I didn't have to pee. Yeah. But then I would find myself getting less interesting, less entertaining, less funny, because I was just like, do I ask? Do I not ask? And who are you impressing? They don't throw you like a parade for having helped. No one longest. gives you a check at the end. Yeah. So it's like, you went four hours and yeah. didn't pee. Right. Everyone's like, do you have a UTI? Are you okay? Like, yeah. you should need. If you're taking care of your health, you should need to. Well, and there is this other thing I'm learning, which is when you do stuff like I have to go to the bathroom or I'm tired or I'm not feeling it or I'm whatever. You're actually doing other people a favor because mm -hmm. maybe they also have to do those things. You're being of service. Yeah. And so like I found this with kids, which we should talk about later. But like like if I have to run to like pick up my kids or my, my kids are sick, I like I try and I I have to get out of something because of it. Mm -hmm. I try to explain that it is a parenting related thing. Yeah. Because I think men especially it's like they have this secret life where they also have children and a family, right? Like, <laughs> That's and, so and, funny. It, and it makes it harder. Many have many secret families. <laughs> but no, it, it like, um, it's like they don't have kids, pictures of their kids in their office. They don't talk about, they don't talk about how their life or their routine or their priorities have shifted as mm -hmm. having a kid. And so it makes it harder for other people. Like that becomes normative. So it's like, oh, don't talk about this. That's not what we do. Huh. When really we should be having the opposite effect. We should be making the opposite contribution, which is making it okay yeah. to have reasons that you don't do things. And so I think when you're like, I'm tired, I'm not feeling it, or I have to pee, you're, you're, you're not just speaking up for yourself, but you're also making it clear that that's an okay thing to do. If someone doesn't take care of themselves, it's a really big red flag. Yeah. Martyrs are really troublesome. It's taken me a long time to realize that. Um, I was raised in a way that you were rewarded for how self deprivation, you know, how much self deprivation sure. you could tolerate, mm -hmm. how self contained you were, and how little you complained. That served me really well in sports. It served me really well in my family environment. But the root of that is insecurity, right? Like right. you won't like me if I have a human limitation. And insecure people are dangerous. Yeah. These are people that are trying to be liked. Is anyone like, I really liked her. She didn't pee the whole time. <laughs> yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like, you know what? I really like that guy. He has four kids and didn't bring them up once. Yes. Isn't right. he awesome? <laughs> right. Like, no one thinks that's cool. Yeah, except we do, like, if you are someone who is putting other things in front of the work thing. I think mm -hmm. you are worried you're going to have a reputation of being difficult or you're going to have a reputation of being selfish or not totally invested. Mm, I think, it, I, I guess it depends on what the job is and how you do it. You know, I think that if you're someone, for me, when I'm hiring, yeah. it's a huge advantage to me if someone is a parent. Because to me, that already means, you know, they know how to diffuse conflict. Sure. Moms and dads are the best in a room where writers are fighting because they're like, hey, guys, does any, do you need a water? Yeah, Does sure. anyone need a snack? Do you yeah. want to go take a nap? Right. Because usually that's the reason there's conflict going on, right? And they talk to people kind of in very simple ways, the way you would kids. They're great at time management. Their tolerance for drama is just like so much higher, what yeah. they find, you know. And um, and I always, I always, you know, and also moms want to get you out earlier. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. like I love working with moms in L.A. because the writer's rooms used to start at 10. For a mother, that's like two hours to kill between the time you drop your kid. So they're yeah, like, let's sure. start at 9.30 and be done at 3. Right. You know, so it's like, and they get stuff done so much. They, they're they like octopuses. They have so many tentacles. They can multitask and do 50 things at once. So I think to have any kind of shame about having priorities in your life and love in your life. And I'm always excited about the perspective that comes with that, you know, of going like, can we ask a mom what she thinks about this? Can we ask a father? Like, he probably yeah, actually sure. has perspective on something like this. When I wrote The Daily Stoke eight years ago, I had this crazy idea that I would just keep it going. The book was 366 meditations, but I'd write one more every single day and I'd give it away for free as an email. I thought maybe a few people would sign up. Couldn't have even comprehended a future in which three quarters of a million people would get this email every single day and would for almost a decade. If you want to get the email, if you want to be part of a community that is the largest group of Stoics ever assembled in human history, I'd love for you to join us. You can sign up and get the email totally for free. No spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want at dailystoic.com slash email. But I've talked to athletes about this. It's like an athlete has to know how to play hurt, but can't play through injury. Interesting. Right? There's this, right? Yep. So it's like, yep. uh, if you only play when you're feeling 100%, you're mm -hmm. never going to play. Yeah. And you're just frankly not tough enough to do this thing at the pro level. Sure, sure. And yet, if you're constantly ignoring what your body is telling you, yep. that's when you blow out your knee mm -hmm. or you, you take a what what could have been a, a minor injury and you turn it into a major injury. So knowing that line, that's mm -hmm. really the tough part. And you got to know yourself and you got to know when to blow it out. So for me, I'm kind of a dork, uh, probably twice a week when I want to give up or be a brat. Um, I watch Carrie Strug at the Olympics. Do you remember Carrie Strug? When she's doing on the bad leg or whatever? Yes, it was like between, her, of course, always Russia. Her and Russia. America's down like three points in gymnastics. Yeah. First tumble she did, breaks her ankle. Sure. She's got to be do a perfect score for the next one to beat Russia. Yeah. She's never going to compete again. Yeah. This is the time to do it. Sticks the landing, tears sure. everything else in her body, perfectly collapses. I love moments like that. Yeah. Where you're like, this is the moment I'm, I am injured, but I'm going to push through it. But you really, I think that the winners know when to pull that stop out. So you don't do it in game one, you do it in game six. Yeah, like the, the Michael Jordan flu game is a, it should be called the Michael Jordan flu playoff game. Love it. It's Love not it. a regular season yeah. game. It's not a preseason game. But yeah, it's like, hey, you wake up and your kid is sick. Do you take care of them? Or do you go, no, I'm someone who shows up and does my writing. Like, yeah. I think one of the things that you need to have as an artist is kind of, a sense of self-importance, mm -hmm. right? Like yep. you believe that this thing is the most important thing in the world, which it's not. Sure, sure. And so that tension between like, I'm committed, I don't make excuses, I show up and do the thing every day, and then being a selfish asshole. Well, is that's a when hard... you have to know yourself. You have yes. to go, I'm gonna, my kid is sick, I'm gonna go write my book, but is my work gonna be mediocre because I'm gonna be thinking about my kid the whole time? Sure. Am I gonna be distracted the whole time thinking about my kid? Or do I split the difference? Going, you know what, I'm gonna do two hours not think about the kid once he will be fine kids are resilient yeah whatever my mom did speed when she was pregnant with me like whatever put whiskey on my gums sure. they'll be fine i'll show up in two hours he'll never yeah. know the difference or do you go nine hours and just split your attention the whole time you know yeah and also i think some of it for me is early on i was so insecure 
And or sorry, do you go, hey, I'm going to go write this book because it's going to pay for this kid's medical care, which is what he needs. You know what I mean? You got to like sure. find the way to be able to make sure that your focus is pure. But I feel like I as I've gotten more confident and more secure in myself, I know I, I realize that any one day is not life or death. That's right. But you have early on, you have this sense, this almost delusional sense that like, if I don't do it, mm -hmm. then I won't do it the next day and I won't do it the next day. And, yeah. won't do it the, and it's like, you know, I now know that's not true. Yeah. I know that if I take one day off, it doesn't lead into a two month slump where yeah. I don't do anything because I've built that habit. And you're, the reason you should be building that habit or that capital with yourself is so you can spend it on things that matter, which is yourself or people that you care about. I actually right? think it's probably great to step away every now and then. You and I were sure. texting about this, like sort of like a routinized life. And I felt really kind of sloppy about being like, you know, I really, I used to have really obsessive routines and, you know, I was very regimented and I was producing very regimented work, sure. you know? And I realized sometimes the best thing I can do is step away for a couple hours in order for art to imitate life, you have to have a life, right? Yeah. So it's like, let me just allow life to inspire me and, you know, let spontaneity happen. You know, I now know that the way that I'm built, the amount of validation and <laughs> success I need in order to function is so high that even if I'm at 80%, it's still going to probably be overachieving bullshit, you yeah, know? Sure, so sure, sure. a lot of times the best thing I could do is go to the farmer's market or quote unquote waste time. Yes. I think as an artist, you're never wasting time. As a writer, as a philosopher, you're never wasting time sure. because you're going to go, oh, I have to run this errand and I'm going to be taken away from my book. And then you're going to see some crazy shit that happens at the pharmacy and you're like, oh my God, I have to like write about that or I never thought about that, et cetera. Right. Or you're going to put in a podcast on the way and go, oh, Ryan Holiday just said this thing. I need to go write this thing. Yeah, it's you're getting material and you and you have a, a greater sense of that you're always working, even if you're not sitting at the I found desk. when I was working my hardest, I didn't have enough original ideas. I mean, I remember being in a writer's room when I was making a TV show and was working, you know, 18 hour days, weekends, killing it, banging out scripts, was doing two sitcoms simultaneously, and we'd be in the writer's room and it was a show about a couple, yeah. right? And we're pitching on, so like, what would the couple do on like a Saturday night, you know? And someone was like, oh, well, what if they like go to a baby shower? I'm like, people don't go to baby showers. They're like, well, what if she, they went to like a wine tasting? I'm like, oh, wine taste. That's like a thing you do in a sitcom. And they're like, Whitney, um, people have lives. <laughs> sure. I'm like, what if they're home, like working on their, like making their side hustle a business? Like yeah. what if they're trying to make their website into like a brand? And they're like, Whitney, no, this you're is just, <laughs> this is your workaholism. Yeah, you have no sense of what life actually is because you're not living one. Yeah, not living one. When I I, I remember right when my wife was pregnant, she was about we were about to have kids, and I was being interviewed. This New York Times reporter was at my house, and she was like, she she was like, show me your routines. So I'm like walking her through all the stuff, and she was like, how do you think your routine will change when you have kids? And I was like, oh, I don't Ooh. think it will change. That's what I said. I was like, I don't think it will change. Because I have this system and all kind, and of course it totally blew my life up. But in a really good way, I was yeah. forced to like because my routine was, although effective, fundamentally selfish and self indulgent, and so my day was revolving around me and my preferences, mm. right? And then so somebody else or something else comes into that, and it's forced. It forces you to first off eliminate all the inessential, inefficient parts of your right, routine right, in life. Because right. you're so like, you realize what I've been doing in eight hours, I could probably do in four. Yeah. And then you also realize like that your consistency slash uh, regularity is also a form of fragility mm. because you need it to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you make it that way and you build things around it as though you are in control and that you can always make it this way, mm -hmm. and you can't. Mm -hmm. And then life or children or something comes in and goes, actually, fuck all that, yep. start over. And that's actually really good. So I think in the beginning, it's really important for discipline. Like I see so many people that are like trying to start writing or trying to start comedy or whatever. And in the beginning, I think it's like, get up. If you're going to do stand up, yeah. get up five nights a week, write for an hour a day, yes. get first thing in the morning when you have the most energy before you get on your phone, make sure you're right. I think it's really important in the beginning, but then I think you got to know when you can trust yourself yes. and know like, okay, like now I kind of, the best thing I can do is 
watch someone else's stand up. The best thing I can do is read a book. The yeah. best thing I can do is like watch a movie, like a stupid watch Paul Blart Mall Cop, you know what I mean? Or yeah, like yeah. take care of my health or like go stretch or something. You know, I think it's like important to know when it's time to update your software yeah. and update your routine and maybe make it less rigid after a while. Cause for me, it's like, I used to think, okay, I have to do like 50, I have to do an hour of this stand up of 50 cities everywhere in the country to make sure it works everywhere. For a special. For a special. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be like, I need to make sure this works everywhere. And I need to make sure it works in Wisconsin. It works in Florida. It works everywhere. It works in Vegas because that's yeah. a cross section of the world. And blah, blah, blah. And now I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, if I have a premise going or I'm like incubating, I can hop on Zoom with like four comics and be like, is there anything to this? Is this funny? Have you yeah. heard this? And I kind of just say it. And they're like, yep, thumbs up. And I'm like, I got it. Yeah. I know what to do. You know, whereas before I'd be like, this is going to take me a year. And at the time it did, but then I had to update my software and go like, I've got all these muscles in place now and I need to know when I can trust myself and know when the best thing I can do as an artist and as an observational person is like, go to the grocery store, go sit in traffic, listen to somebody else talk, get out of your own head. I really like that updating the software metaphor because I think, so there's two ways to think about it, right? One, which is it takes 50 hours to do a special or whatever, or um, you're like, it takes 50 hours, that's what it takes. And so anytime you're trying to rationalize doing 40 hours or 30 hours this other way, is you cutting corners and telling, like you getting complacent or uh, coasting, right? Which some people do, mm -hmm. they get successful and they coast and they get worse. I see a lot of, co thanks for pointing that out because a lot of people get mediocre, be but a lot of times they get mediocre because they get in front of their fans. Yeah who already have a vested interest in thinking this has to work. They already paid $50 and they got parking and they yeah. paid for a babysitter and they already know you're funny. Sometimes you got to get up, not in front of your fans, but your enemies. Sure. You got to get up in front of some comedians that don't want you to have a great next special, even if they're your friends, they're going to be competitive. And what you want at that point is I'm going to go, ah, oh, God damn it, that's funny shit. Yeah, I wish I'd thought of that. And I'm like, all right, I have something there. But, but if doing it and getting better at it isn't also making you more efficient mm -hmm. like or stronger at it then what does that say like the yeah. idea that it, it should take the same amount of time yeah or cost the same amount of money or cost the same amount of whatever to like then then you're maybe not getting better mm -hmm. right like like I might I be preparing different ways at this point. So instead of going in front of a bunch of people who have already paid to see me and already yeah. know me and like me, I might go to a dinner party and be sitting next to someone that clearly we disagree on everything and, and run some sh shit by them and just argue with them for a while and go like, yeah. oh, okay, that was helpful. Yeah. Just knowing like other ways. It's like, you know, to train. Yeah. It's like if my first book required me sitting in this chair, no exceptions for this amount of time, mm -hmm. that's great. But now I've done that. So the next time it would be weird if I had to... I had to be stuck in the same box. And then as you do it more and more and longer, mm -hmm. if you're not getting more efficient and the process isn't changing, then it feels like that feels like probably the wrong way to do it too. So, and then so also figuring out what year, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I'm just so afraid I'm going to forget this because yeah. I think it might be useful um, to your listeners who I know are edification junkies like us, which is also going, what's my goal for the next one? I go yeah. like, okay, these jokes were great in this one, but this next special, I want to be more conversational. So it's like my, like I've done six specials. I've one, you know, that's about to come out. That's more conversational. The ones before I always wrote it out, right? Yeah. I'm in front of a word document. Here's a joke. Here's a setup. This past one, I went, you know what? I'm only going to talk into my voice memos when I'm walking. I'm just gonna, and then I'm gonna transcribe it later. Yeah. Because I found myself, things were too surgical, they were too sharp, they were, I, it was all about editing and not just about like flow. And I had a completely different process. I was like yeah. not even in an office, I was walking around, saying the jokes, working them out, sort of having a conversation with myself. I probably yeah. looked like a crazy person <laughs> in my neighborhood. And then I transcribed it. So it was a completely different process. Yes, and it should, it, that's enough, That's also challenging yourself and being disciplined. Like the discipline to say, I'm going to do it differently. Or like on one, a couple books ago, I was like, I'm gonna start, like every one of my books up until this point it has been miserable writing it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to also not hate myself and make other people hate me while I do it. Like I'm gonna yeah. enjoy it and not be, I'm not gonna let it like destroy me. And yeah. so that took a different kind of discipline. And weirdly it took the discipline to say, I'm going to take today off instead of like insisting on doing it today or whatever. It, the idea of of that discipline taking different forms, I think is a more, uh, a more masterful understanding even of what discipline is. This is a weird mind trick that I'm gonna pitch. Um, 
So the last like 10 or so years, um, my parents have been in hospitals. They had strokes very young. And so I've been in like ICUs and nursing homes and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was so brutal for so long. I wrote a lot of comedy in the waiting rooms of ICUs and stuff. Wow. And I was so excited to not be staring at death yeah. and to be around such horror. Yeah. I also would see sitcoms playing in the ICU rooms. Mm -hmm. I would see these families that were sobbing and then they'd be watching Reba and then they'd be <laughs> around their dying relative and they'd be watching Seinfeld. Yeah. So there was kind of this magical thing happening that was like, yeah. okay, I'm gonna put something in that box that's gonna brighten people up, but I also <laughs> needed the escape so badly. Yeah. And I think that if you don't need the escape like that, don't poison your parents or anything. But I think it's also important to put yourself in a situation where the hard thing you're doing is a respite. So whether it's you're doing some brutal workout in the morning or you're going to go be of service and volunteer somewhere. Yeah. Like I always tell people, like, make it so that you have to do what you're doing. Make it so it's like like a fun break, like the, your drudgery of writing the thing is kind of a fun respite from something else. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a respite from having to deal with your kids that are freaking yeah. out, whatever it is. But I act that accidentally happened. And then I started doing it intentionally. I started going, oh, I'm going to go visit my mom and I'll finish the script there because I know I'll finish it in the lobby. I know that if I just stay home all day yeah. and do it here, I'm going to find a million other things to do. But if I go visit her and then go in the lobby for an hour, I will bang this out. Yeah, maybe the question is is like, am I doing the easy thing or the hard thing? Yep. So it's like, are you sit laying around watching TV because writing is hard mm -hmm. and you don't want to write? Or are you saying, no, like I'm gonna go do this self-care day or I'm gonna do this other it's it's if you're taking the easy way out, it's probably the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. If you're actually challenging yourself in some way and that challenge can take a variety of forms, mm -hmm. that's then you're probably doing the right thing. Do you ever bribe yourself? In what way? Like I'll do like, if I finish five pages of this, I get to call my friend Nikki and tell her about that date last night, but not uh, until I do five pages. No, you know, really. that's a small little sure. silly treat, but then it's like, you know, or like if I get this done, I get to have a steak for dinner. Like it's little things to kind of trick yourself. I've gone through a lot of these. I haven't done a lot of those in a while, but little things like that have helped me before. No, I don't really do. I do that like when I'm like working out or, or like let's say I'm swimming, I think about it in small chunks. Mm -hmm. So I don't go like I'm swimming a mile, I'm swimming seven sets of however many. And then I'm trying to create the momentum of like finishing. Yeah, you little, break it down. Little things. Because like so that's to go like mental trick. if know the thing that you're addicted to and then reward yourself with it. So yeah. today it would probably be, okay, you know, if I write these five pages, I get to go on Instagram for yeah. 20 minutes, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or just like finding a way to bribe yourself. I, f I get to go buy something on Etsy for $50, like whatever yeah. little thing. I found with uh, like the other change I'm making, and I wondered if th when you were saying you're not a routine person, I think as I've gotten older, had kids, been doing this longer, I don't think about it as having a routine. I think about it as having routines, like mm. plural, like, like I'm switching to a new routine because it's daylight savings and it is Ooh. not possible for me to run in the evenings where I live. Right. So like now I have to get up earlier and I have to do it in the morning, right? And right. so oh, wow. there's the routine when on this day of the week when both the kids are in school and then there's a routine when only one of them is in school and there's a routine where, where one of them's sick or there's the mm. routine when I've been traveling. Like I have different routines that I, I can sort of I'm never like, oh, I'll just do whatever I want today. Mm -hmm. It's like I have a book of routines that are all pre-approved. And depending on the circumstances, I can pick one. And it's got like good practices in it. And as yes. long as the day is mostly made up of those good practices, it was a good day. Can I actually tell you I lied to you? Okay. I do have some routines, but I guess they, they're they're a little bit different than like the idea of you sit down and then you have this and you have the egg timer and that, yeah. like I've done all that and you have the note cards. Sure. Mine are actually more about like hygiene and the day bef the night before. Oh. So little things that are going to throw you an hour off the next day, which yeah. making sure I have no excuse to procrastinate, right? Sure. I identify as a perfectionist. I know you talk about this a lot. Perfectionism leads to procrastination, yeah. which leads to paralysis. So the computer's plugged in the night before. 
the charger is in the wall. There's an extension cord. If my back hurts, the heating pad's already plugged in. I'm not going to spend 20 minutes the next day being like, well, where's the heating pad? Where's the extension? You know what I mean? Sure. Getting ahead of it, like cleaning the office ahead of time because I'll take the opportunity to go, well, these mugs from last night, it's cleaned up. Also, a big thing for me is because I work from home, a lot of people do now, no working in pajamas. You're getting up, you're yes. washing your face, you're brushing your teeth, you're putting on underwear. In my case, it's always a thong because that's just psychologically like we're awake. Yeah, sure. Socks, shoes. You yeah. all, I always wear sneakers inside when I'm writing. A you're dressing for that's work. That's right. Yeah. Dressing for work is a huge one. If yeah. you're just like in your pajamas, jammies, and like roll up, and there's like it's a mess. Like I personally can't get focused. I'm putting like yeah. lotion on. Like I got my tea tree oil. Like I do have a little spruce oil and a tea tree oil because I think like little smells like that like just help kind of like yeah. with like Pavlovian cues, kind of that sort of thing. And I turn my phone and disturb. I mean the phone I have to put in the other room, but I do the yeah. do not disturb. Like just little things like that, just to eliminate future distractions. Yeah, I like the uh, like sort of dressing as though it's serious. Like one of the reasons we got this whole place was like working from home. It's hard to have boundaries. That's right. And so like going to the office is uh -huh. good. But like, yeah, I do the same thing, even though the pandemic, it's like I don't really wear like regular clothes anymore. I'm mostly like wearing workout clothes. But it's like I but what get do you wear under them, like <laughs> underwear, clean underwear, clean socks and shoes. For me, it's uh, it's showering and shaving in okay, the morning, great. Like, even though I can't really grow a beard. But the process of being clean shaven yep. is to me a message to myself that like work is starting mm -hmm. and you're wiping the slate clean and you're an adult. Pavlov's what, yeah. eye drops, whatever the thing is for you that sure. wakes you up and signals like we're working now. Yes. And do you have those for different things? Like I have like my on the road ones, like I shower before I give a talk and I crank it to cold at the end or, Ooh. you know, like I do certain things like I, I, there's not just the general routine, but there's also the kind of little like before you go on stage rituals. Mm. Do you have? The before I go on stage rituals are normally like, like just about hydrating and eating and that kind of thing and make sure the Sharpies are in play. Like yeah. afterwards, there's like meet sure. and greets. It's kind of more being prepared for what happens afterwards when people rush to the yeah. stage. I want to have my Sharpies. You know, I got to make sure there's a clock on stage, sound check, kind of stuff like that. I think now I'm at the point as a stand-up where I want to be as spontaneous as possible when I go on stage. Yeah. But I think for me, the routine is more about having you know, four or five references and jokes about the specific city oh. that will make them feel special, you yeah. know, which is, you know, maybe more applicable to people that go in for job interviews or, you know, are speaking on podcasts or something like doing research about the place that I am so that I go out there and I'm not just doing a generic show that I do in every city. Like I have a couple things in my back pocket, which makes me feel like way more free. Like I know that, you know, the grocery store is Bucky's instead of, you know, Giant or whatever, you know, and I'll like read the Sure. news of the city, like local news, oh. so that when something comes up and someone yells something out, it's like, oh, well, there's a serial killer that just pushed someone off a bridge or whatever right. it is, you know? So yeah. I think it's just more making sure that I'm super prepared to be spontaneous. Yeah, there's a Flaubert quote. It's something like, if you can be orderly in your personal life. Orderly and regular in your personal life, you could be brave and violent in your professional life. Yeah. It's and so the, favorite. the idea of, of being chaotic and spontaneous on stage or in the work, whether it's painting or writing or the sales call, it starts by being somewhat orderly in the other stuff. And orderly having a system or structure. and regular. Yeah. And this is, I live by this quote, so interesting you brought it up, you know, because I, you were, we were kind of texting and talking about like inspirational quotes and books and such. And I think that when I was thinking about oh, like what books would I say are my favorite books or most influential books and a lot of relationship books kept coming up. Oh. And I was like, oh, is this going to sound like I'm like, you know, I know that, that people listen to this podcast, it's all about business, it's all about being an entrepreneur, it's all, but I believe that your relationship is a business decision. Not mm -hmm. because you're going into business with your spouse or starting a company. If you can do that, Godspeed. Sure. Um, I haven't seen a lot of people work with the person they're with and it goes swimmingly, but because of the person you choose is gonna decide how much energy you have and what the quality of your work life is like. So it's like, I find that when it comes to choosing a mate, sometimes, a lot of your work should go into getting that right yeah. so that your actual work is not going to be constantly affected because you're constantly distracted and you're cleaning up messes and you're unhappy and you're depleted. Like the most successful people I know have or like regular kind of boring, amazing relationships. Yeah. 
Yeah, you have to be tethered to reality in some way, so you can be kind of crazy and. It's like out Rick of it. Rubin says, like your work should be the most stressful part of your day. Yeah, you shouldn't go home to chaos. Yes, at least chaos from kids. That's different. Sure, but you shouldn't have to go home and go to war. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's this Cyril Connolly line, and he says, um, "The most somber enemy of good art is the pram in the hall." like the stroller in the hall, which is like about the saddest quote you can ever hear. And I don't, I find it to be not true at all. I've, I found that sort of having kids is very rooting mm -hmm. and it created structure and it created prioritization and it opened me up in a bunch of ways that, mm -hmm. that were necessary. But I, I do think if you don't have structure and routine, it's very hard to have the safe space you need to be crazy in the work because your whole life is crazy. And you I need think, this like, I'm going yep. into the workspace now. I think it's also just boils down to energy. And I, I make this silly metaphor sometimes about energy dollars, mm -hmm. which is like, let's say you have a hundred energy dollars a day. Like we yeah. have a finite amount of energy yeah. a day, right? And <laughs> it drives my friend nuts because they're like, hey, do you want to come do this thing tonight? And I'm like, I don't have any energy dollars left. That's like it's not, it. I'm not making this choice. It's just, I've spent them all today, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I have a hundred energy dollars today. I woke up, I wrote for three and a half hours. That was like 30 energy dollars. Then I went for a run. That was like 15 energy dollars. And then I had this call and this Zoom. And that was like, and so let's say we're at 80 energy dollars at yeah. six o'clock. And then my man comes home and it's like, well, I need to hear about his day. And I want to hear what's going on with him. And I want to make him dinner. Yeah. And then we're going to jump in bed or do whatever we're going to do. And like, it's now 8.30 and I'm at 100 energy dollars and a friend calls and is like, I need to talk to you about my ex-boyfriend and I need a break. And I'm like, I'm going to be taking energy dollars from tomorrow then. And then I'm going to start sure. tomorrow at a deficit. So I can't take your call tonight, Yeah. but I can talk to you first thing in the morning and then I'll make that hour Zoom a half an hour Zoom. Like I, th maybe that's where my sure. routines come in. Yeah. Because I, I don't believe that when you're working at a deficit energy wise, you're doing anybody a service by talking to them on the phone, getting on your computer, sending that email, whatever it is. So I just stay really loyal to a finite amount of energy. And I see a lot of people destroying careers because they're spending most of their energy in some relate toxic relationship where they're fighting and in some, you know, recreating their childhood circumstance and some pugnacious acrimonious thing that's just like draining all their energy. Yeah. And it's like, are you getting paid to be in this relationship? Because you could be using all this in your work. Sure. No wonder you're not getting anything done. Yeah, or they're just spending the energy just saying yes to a bunch of things that they shouldn't be doing, mm -hmm. traveling. They're, you're not- It's a big one. You're not doing the main thing, which is the actual creative work. And then it also really helps with like, for me, yes, every time someone cuts me off in traffic, I live in Los Angeles, I wanna like follow them for <laughs> 25 minutes. Like, but that's gonna be 15 energy dollars. So you, it kind of, things get really simple when you boil it down to like, oh, am I gonna give my energy to that thing? Yeah. Because if I'm giving it to this, I'm taking it away from this. Yeah. And that's not paying me. Right. I try no. to get like really simple when it comes to that. When I, I I think about it, it's like I promised a certain amount of that to the work, which mm -hmm. is like what fulfills me and, you know, challenges me and is exciting and also pays the bills. And then I promised the bulk of it to family. Mm -hmm. Like I made this choice. Like no yeah. one told me I had to, but yeah. I, I did it. And so... I just really can't afford any of this other stuff. But it's also like, I was talking about this to someone the other day um, about sort of all these high perform, this like moment of all these like high performers and and one of them came up and someone was like, how come people don't like this person, you know? And I was like, I think it's because they don't walk the walk and they come off like a hypocrite. This person talks all about extending your life and having balance and how to, you know, not work so hard and work so smart and all they do is work and they have no life. Right. So I look at you and I go like, yeah, the ego is the enemy. You've written all these amazing books and you have the life that I want. So I'm going to trust you. Hmm. You have a family, you're well balanced. You know what I mean? So it's like when you see all these people, they're like, get it together and go to therapy and do this and da da da. And they're just kind of like alone and miserable. You're like, well, why am I going to listen to you? Like, I, sure. I just want to make sure that you're walking the walk. That's true. So it's like you've, the family is kind of the thing. Yeah, do you know this term art monsters? No. Oh, uh, some female writer talking about she's like, I want to be an art monster, meaning like only the art and fuck everything and everyone else. Because that's what 
basically male it's artists have been allowed. Called a narcissist, but male, okay. <laughs> male artists have been allowed to be this for basically all of human. You know, your Hemingways. It, it's just sure, the, sure. the like they they made amazing stuff, but then they left this like wake of destruction and pain and broken people behind them. Yeah, and. Uh, in a way, it's easier to be that, or sure. it's, it's way easier to be that. It's not necessarily more fun in the long run. But, also, but paint it's back then was very toxic. <laughs> yes, they sure. were all high. They yes. were all like brain dead. Right, they were like drinking out of lead. Yeah, cans they were just inhaling yeah. lead all day. Let's give them a little break. But but do you know what I mean? This, this idea of like, um, I I think it's Sel radical selfishness or something. Yeah, but but just like. At the end of your life, if you have like a, this stack of this work, but it came at this cost, you're not going to be like, oh, it's totally worth it. I think it's also knowing when to do that. I did that in my 20s hard. Mm -hmm. I was not fit to be in a relationship with anybody. I was not the person that someone that I would have wanted would have been attracted to. I think I had some kind of like Darwinian understanding of like my 20s is when to go the hardest ambition wise mm -hmm. and to be that selfish because otherwise I'm just going to be selfish in a relationship with somebody. I'm just going to hurt somebody. I'm going to lie to someone. I'm going to cheat on someone. You know what I mean? And I worked like an animal in my 20s. Yeah. And then in my 30s, I kind of tried to find balance relatively unsuccessfully. And now I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, I think it's okay to be kind of let yourself be that selfish in your 20s and kind of know when to, again, update your software. And But what if you didn't make it? Not, not like you didn't make it career-wise, uh -huh. which could also work. Yeah. But like you can also pick up habits or make decisions that are catastrophic right mm -hmm. or or fatal even sure right so it's like the idea of being like profoundly unbalanced for a period and then balancing out it worked in your case yeah but i'm sure there are people you met or were peers of yours that haven't come out of that spiral and maybe they can't come out of that spiral they can't pull themselves out of that dot and it's interesting because it's like you say peers and i think it also helps to go and someone said this to me very early and i'm very i'm this is embarrassing, but I'm going to say it. I made vision boards, cut out in magazines, yeah. print it out, Comedy Central Presents on a printer at Kinko's, cut it out, glued it on, speaking of inhaling chemicals, I do love <laughs> rubber cement. Maybe that was why. And this is what I want. Like, yeah. I was very, I was reading The Secret. I was like, and look, I'm not saying necessarily like The Secret is real it, a lot of people i know that got into it did get successful maybe it's just the kind of person that would buy that book is already the kind of person that's working hard it's like yeah it's like vitamins i know they work but it's also if you're the kind of person buying vitamins you're probably taking care of yourself in a lot of other ways too yeah, so sure. is it the vitamins or is it the other variables whatever so i was just obsessed with like putting it out there saying it i'm gonna do this there's just no other option. I was yeah. very calculated about it. And someone said to me, cause I was like, oh, who should I put on my vision board? Like what people? Yeah. And someone said, pick three careers that you want. Okay. Not 50, Yeah. not peers. Cause you can look at someone and go like, oh, he's doing well, but like- You don't know. I don't know the whole thing. Yeah. And just do who what did they pick? did. I picked Ellen Okay. was one of them. Yeah. John Stewart was one of them. And Roseanne was one of them. Okay. And I studied how long they worked at it. Yeah. Like, because that was back in the day when you would, you know, be a comic for 20 years before you would get the sure. Tonight Show. You yeah. know, now you can kind of like do some TikToks and get some visibility. And, you know, you can get famous, but you might not yeah. be great yet, whatever. So I was like, oh, I have 20 years. Like, I have to work hard for 20 years. Like, wow. I already kind of had that. Sure. And I was like, I need to turn 20 years into 15 years. That's too long. So I was like double psycho. Okay. But I think it's important, like, when people are trying to figure out the career they want or like who to compete with or who to aspire to. Like don't pick, don't look at everybody. Yeah. Just look at like two or three people. Yeah. That helped me. Cause sure. when people are like, well, so-and-so is doing this. I'm like, I don't, I'm looking here. Right. This is the person I chose to emulate. So I just, I can't. When I see, when I look back on that period, it's like when I was in my twenties, I was basically working sort of three simultaneous careers. And I definitely think I fast forward, you know, you get your 10,000 hours. I was doing them three hours at a time. It's it was wild. great. But at the same time, how much of it was actually moving the needle and how much of it was my intensity and not being able to, hmm. do you know what I mean? Like, like, yes. like could I have, could I have actually done 70% as much and ended up in the exact same place? Probably did all these things that I thought were these sort of live or die moments or like everything was counting on. 
it was you know all what, in you my guys, head. Here's this is this is what I'm going to say about you, and I'm going to say it right to the camera. I can tell who a person is uh, based on the part of their Christmas tree that faces the wall. Okay. Do you decorate the part of the Christmas tree that faces the wall or not? Okay. Are you the person that just decorates around just where everybody kind of sees it? Sure. But that if a kid goes to go get a, something that's fallen, they're going to, there's no magic in the back. So you think you should decorate the whole tree? Yes. Okay. So we're in a studio where you see there's a billion of these books. There's tons of books behind the cameras that no one can see. Mm, okay. You're that, you're the person that goes all around the track. So you just said like, could you get it gotten away with 70%? No, because people would have walked in here and been like, so you just stopped there? <laughs> well, it doesn't technically go all the way. But you but it's you don't have you didn't have to do that part. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? I get, no, I don't mean like I could have phoned it in. I'm just saying like there was a there was our but there's I don't think our brains work that way. That's what I mean. I think your brain it was, wants it was just for me. You're either a cheater or you're not. You're either the kind of person that does the right thing when no one's what like I think it's important to you know yourself about that when you want to cheat. When you're like, I could totally get away with this. But then I would know. But see, I've also been to workaholics meetings, or many of them. And part part of the reason you're going is because you don't have a healthy a healthy sure. relationship sure. of what you should and shouldn't be doing. Sure. And is a it sense, a compulsion? Does it yes. stop? If it, is if it's diminishing marginal returns, yeah. or if it's a if it stops being fun, yeah. right? Which is a trick thing for work because, like, for most addictions, they say like, okay, you know, it's an addiction if it stops being fun and becomes an obligation, yeah. right? Is it making your life unmanageable? But mm -hmm works tricky because you're like, well, it is for now, but if I just finish this book, then I'm gonna get this money and it's not gonna be unmanageable, yeah. you know? Right. It's a tricky one to know, but I always just say, go balls to the wall because if it doesn't work out, you'll always know you went balls to the wall. Yeah. Yeah, I just, like, I just think of the things that I thought mattered so much. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, they were all part of a larger inability to sort of separate what was really important from what wasn't in a kind of a compulsion, like rooted in a in a kind of anxiety and also a need to prove something to people. You know what people. else though? I get to move through life when people are like, so I have imposter syndrome. I'm like, I don't. I actually believe I deserve more <laughs> <laughs> than I have. You know what I mean? Like sure. I see people that are like, I'm just not sure if I deserve that. I'm like, I don't have to live like that at all. You know, I, I, I don't want anything I don't deserve. I like knowing I went a little harder than I needed to. Um, I like knowing that I got everything honestly. I, I, I kind of, now that I look back at that, because I could easily say like, oh, that was kind of pathological how hard you worked. Yeah. I'm like, I just don't believe in wasted time like that when it comes to, you know, it's like um, uh, Johnny Carson used to say, there's no such thing as a wasted written joke because a B, like, you know, a B joke mm -hmm. that you maybe don't, that you've written that doesn't work on stage extemporaneously, it's an A joke. So I have notebooks of jokes that have never gone on stage, but like I'll use them at some point. Or also just writing them was itself good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. It was a rep. Yeah, it's like saying like, oh, like running that extra mile every day, you know, when I was training, like was a waste of time. I could have just ran five and I ran six. Sure. It's like, well, it's kind of hard to tell. Because yeah, I mean, you're also here. How can you say that it didn't work? Yeah, I mean, the stuff you cut from the book is still informing what it was. It's still practice. It's all, it's practice is practice. Yeah, and you need contrast, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it's after you make pasta, you strain out the water. That doesn't mean putting the water in was a waste of time. No, definitely not. That's a great metaphor. You know? Do you, when you got the success you were working so crazy hard for though, were you like, did it, what, what did it feel like? Did it, did, were you actually able to feel it in any way? I think maybe that's why when I look back on it, I go, I thought this was going to give me something. I thought I was going to feel a certain way. And of course, you don't get it at it's all. Like, it's like, it's this. I mean, I'm, I'm making myself laugh because it is, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone into, I'm in a program called ACA, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics, which is if you just grew up and I know people shut down when they hear that word sometimes, you know, we say in order for alcoholism to be present, alcohol doesn't have to be present. So yeah. I actually come from a lot of workaholism. Yeah. You know, our moms were the first women that were really in the workforce. I went to work with my mom and, you know, I sat there. She worked at Bloomingdale's. So she ran around like a crazy person. My sure. dad, I'd wake up in the middle of the night to go get a snack and he'd be recopying phone number. You know, I grew up around addiction, um, compulsive behavior, alcoholism, all kinds of stuff. But, um, uh, you know, I would go to a lot of open AA meetings to learn about 
alcoholism yeah. because they, you know, when someone else is drinking and it's bothering you or doing drugs and bothering you, they're not doing it at you. Yeah, sure. They're not doing it, you know, and they say, you know, alcoholics drink because they think they have to. Right. Yeah. And another thing that they would say in there, I don't lose my train of thought, is you would hear alcoholics talk and they would say, when I took my first drink, I didn't feel good. Yeah. I felt normal. Yeah. Or relief. Yes. Yeah. I felt like the way I think everyone else, when I felt my first yeah. <laughs> success, I wasn't like, I made it. I was like, oh, God. Yeah. Now I can relax. Yeah. It was kind of more like that in a way. Later, I was able to celebrate victories more. But for me, it was a little more like that feeling of yeah. I felt normal. I felt full for the first time instead yes. of like I had a bonus of all this success. Yeah. I felt like I wasn't at a deficit. You know Tank Sinatra, right? Yes. Yeah, he was He was saying, he was talking to someone and he was like, you know, what do you do to fill the hole? And they were like, what hole? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, if you know, you know. If you like, know, if, you if know. If you're someone who has, like, yeah. I like what you were saying, it's about getting to even. Like, I think some people think that you're driven and you're trying to do all this stuff to feel like the ecstasy of mm -hmm. success. And actually, it's more like a relief Just of a kind calm. of a pain or a distress. Mm -hmm. it, work is one of the few places where I feel emotionally regulated. That's right. That's and, right. And present um, because regular life is not that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you have this fantasy that like getting it's going to make you feel good. And it just makes you feel like not bad. Yeah, that's exactly kind of it. And yeah. I don't, you know, and like we can pathologize it all day long. But, you know, I think that like, you know, it's cooperation and productivity makes dopamine. It's like blame neuroscience. You don't have to blame everything else for it, you know. And I mean, there's worse things, by the way. There's too. worse things. Yeah. And it's also it's, you know, I'm a really big fan of, of healthy addictions. You know, mm -hmm. I think addictive, you know, neurochemistry, it's it can just make you or break you. And I know that I've got it yeah. and I feel really lucky that I've been able to kind of reroute some of my addictive, you know, circuitry to something positive, you know, if you're like, all right, I'm going to be addicted to improving myself. I'm addicted yeah. to Ryan Holiday's podcast. I'm addicted to his books. I'm addicted to, you know, listening to these great podcasters. I mean, when you're addicted to porn and addicted to alcohol, that's when things start to shit hits the fan. But if you can sort of have that warrior spirit and reroute it, I'm like, okay, there's worse things to be addicted to than, you know, building success. I grew yeah. up, you know, with a mom who had to date men she didn't want to date for money you know i did not want to have to do that i sure. did it's better than being a grifter like all the <laughs> yeah, all the sure. energy that i spent in my 20s trying to get successful people are like you're so ambitious and why are you working so hard i'm like i'm sorry i'm not gold digging men like what's my other option here you yeah, know yeah, sure and so you know for me i was like you know trying to make people laugh for a living i think if you have an honorable goal yeah. of like trying to help people learn and help people grow and make people laugh like you know, it's taken me a long time to not have to be like, I'm crazy and messed up just because I want to be successful and make as many people laugh as possible. It's like, maybe that's okay. Yeah. Is, is your thing making the world better or or is your, is your thing additive or extractive? Yeah, totally. Like, I'm not becoming a famous stand-up so that I can, like, prey on people or abuse, pa you know what I mean? Or say gross yeah, stuff. Yeah, some businessman who takes over companies <laughs> yeah. and fires all the employees to, you know, extract, yes. you know, an extra 2% profit or return on his, there, there, there's good ways to fill the hole and bad ways to fill the hole. Yeah, totally. And I think that, you know, so for me, it's, it's so in my nature to be self-deprecating, going, yeah. oh, I'm this narcissist, like, so is this, sure. uh, you know, self-absorbed and da-da-da, but like, just get out of there, you know? Give but yourself permission to shine and do something honorable. And I think there's, you know, I love podcasts like yours because I think there's a lot of weird shame around ambition. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of weird shame about saying like, I want to be famous. Yeah. I want to be rich, you know? I think there's... I grew up without, you know, so maybe it's less shame for me. And, you know, something we'll get to talk about Robert Greene and your past with him later, but something that was before I even read the 48 Laws of Power, any of that, the cover was enough for me to go like, oh, I that's what I want. I didn't realize what I wanted was power. Oh, uh, just the word? Just the word power. Sure, he just came out and said it. I want power. Yeah. Because you don't feel like you have it. Say it. Yeah. What's wrong with saying it? You know, and something that you know, the one thing I will say, sort of, I think in the beginning, I thought I wanted fame because mm. that's what you think you want. Yeah. You know, I grew up around a bunch of alcoholics. When we got, I couldn't get their attention. We'd get home. Sure. They'd be watching the TV. My dad would be watching SNL and Rodney Dangerfield. Couldn't get his attention. And I just, I went, my I brain, yeah. got to get in the box. Yeah. I got to get in there. Yeah. And that was it. That's all, that's all. It was one moment happened from then on out. 
very embarrassing. I would be in my room alone practicing being on talk shows. Whenever I would eat, I would pretend I was in commercials. Like I was, I was getting in that box, Yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. So I went, okay, I think I need fame. And then I hear on Howard Stern, Bill Murray one time is on and Howard Stern's like being famous. That's, ugh, tell me yeah. it's the worst, right? Or whatever. And Bill Murray just went, um, try getting rich and see if you still need to be famous. And I went, oh, wait, I think that's what I want. Wait, ah, yeah, I want to be able to pay my bills. I want freedom from, and then Robert Greene made me go, no, no, I want power. Sure. The power to say no if I don't want to do something. The yeah. power, like. Autonomy, you want control over your life. That's right. Yeah. That's it right. is funny, like when you get, because I think what we're, the root of what, a lot of what we're talking about is just plain old self-awareness. Like, and you get that usually with some distance and perspective and therapy and whatever, but like how transparent and obvious it is in retrospect why we did certain things. Like yeah. for me, my parents were were not like neglectful in that sense, but they were like the not nice way to say it would be like they're like star fuckers and that they were very interested in people who were interesting. Like, Ooh. oh, we went on vacation, you know who we saw? Or like so-and-so lives in this town and you've seen his house. So there was Ooh. a lot of like- Like keeping up with the Joneses type thing? No, no, they were just that, their currency was like knowing about and being impressed by like important people that lived nearby or- The most important thing in my mom's apartment was a framed photo of her and Bill Clinton. Sure, yes. So so this was, this was more like, yeah, so- like uh, where they live, it'd be like, did you know some 80s rock star has a house, like a really nice house up the street from us yeah, like that? Yeah. Kind of being proximity or adjacent sure. to like people who had done things that people had heard Which about. Which are we designed to, this might be a um, from the Sapiens book that we're designed when you go into a room yeah. to rank yourself. Yeah, you're supposed to know the hierarchy and be aware of what's happening in the tribe so the tribe doesn't kick you out. But so, so before they, Instagram, how <laughs> else did you gossip about rich people? But they were very interested in that. And so, and, and then not, it didn't feel like that interested in me as me, Interesting. right? So, so it's like how obvious in retrospect, I went out and did a bunch of things to check boxes. Ooh. And then it happened. Like it happened that like their friends would be like, wait, are you, is he your kid? You know, that kind of wow. thing. Wow. And then what did it do? It did nothing. It did nothing, not only for me, but like actually didn't do anything for them either because fundamentally there was some problem, right? Like you do it all because you want some sense of power or control or autonomy, or you want to impress certain people. Or you want to mm -hmm. shove it in people's faces. And then you realize you can't, you can't actually get I it. I also just love like like you being like, it didn't do anything for me, it didn't do anything for that. Meanwhile, millions of people are like, Ryan's book changed my life. And you're like, oh, it was kind of a fool's air. I do the same no, thing. No, I don't think it's a fool's air. You, know? you just realize, you realize that, that can't you can't do it for, you have to do it because you like it and it's fulfilling to you yep. and soothing to you and meaningful that to you. That original wound doesn't get healed by it, but it is the abset, like the catalyst. Yeah, if you felt like you were playing football to impress your dad, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how many Super Bowls you win. Mm -mm. Your dad will, you will never feel like your dad's fully impressed because there's always this sense of I'm doing it for him and you, you don't control other people mm -hmm. and you'll never get from them what only you can give to yourself. And I, and uh, yeah, and I think it's taken me a long time to go like, oh, that's my origin story, yeah. not my assignment kind of like. Oh, that's a good distinction. Sure. You know, like I just lost both parents and after the second one died, I was like, well, now what? <laughs> I literally was like floating through space and I yeah. was like, and I did feel almost instantly like my drive kind of lift. I was just sort of like, oh, I really was trying to impress them. I really yeah. was trying to get them to, you know, and I was also, um, I, I think I, I love this shit because if we're on the self-awareness thing, birth order is also kind of a thing that took me a while to unlock. Yeah. I was 13 months younger than my older sibling. Obviously a mistake. They called me a surprise, but like I knew it. Yeah. I knew you could feel it. I could feel it. Huh. And I think a lot of really successful people are the youngest child and they kind of, they had to fit into an already established system, which is a big thing. You have to kind of learn how to be a chameleon and kind of like, you know, fit into something or you become like super stubborn because you're like my niece who's the youngest is like we're doing it my way in this because she doesn't want to fit into this already established system she feels like all this pressure to sort of be super independent and i always felt like i was on borrowed time i was a hassle yeah i was an extra expense and i felt it from them too they're like oh, yeah. you know and so i felt like i had to be super successful and overachieve and be needless and wantless and perfect as to not like rock the boat because i was yeah. already pushing it 
I remember my, I grew up in Sacramento, so all I wanted to do was go to school in Southern California, because that seems so different. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my parents had very low sort of, not ex, they had high expectations, which it was clear I was not meeting, but they had low, they had high standards, which I was not meeting, but they had low expectations. Hmm. From, so like, there was this sense that I was like, I wasn't the one that was gonna go places, right? So I remember, <laughs> I, I, I remember like I, I wanted to go to Pepperdine. And so, which is, cause that like on paper, it looks like the greatest Malibu. school in the world. It's yeah, incredible. It's fancy. So I remember we, I finally bully them into sort of letting me to her and they take me. And I remember my mom's walking me around and she goes, you know, she's like, you know, this school is like $30,000 a year. And, and I'm sure it's way more now. She mm -hmm. goes, you would have to become very successful to be worth this. And so you go, oh, okay, so yes, there was this understanding that you're only worth something if you create a return on investment, which is fundamentally not what a parental child relationship is supposed to be. No. So you pick up these sort of assumptions, these offhanded comments that sort of reveal to you the logic of the world. You get these scripts and that was a later script, right? That was like in late high school, but I imagine there must've been versions of this over and over and over mm. again. And then, then it's a process as you get older, those scripts take you to a certain place and then you realize they were adaptive and now they're becoming maladaptive. Yep. And you have to adjust and update the scripts or the software, as you were saying, to find something, a logic about the universe and yourself that's both sustainable and like fair and conducive to happiness mm -hmm. and contentment um, and also true, you know what I mean? Like you can pick up these scripts that like things are scarce because they were scarce when you were a kid, yeah. but they're not scarce for you anymore. You've That's made right. all this money, you've had this, you don't have to, you know, act like you're about to run out of stuff. So you have to kind of update these scripts or these ideas as you go, because they're based on assumptions that were either never true mm -hmm. or are certainly not true anymore. And that's something I love about being in a 12-step program, because even though it spooks people, it is free medicine and it does kind of wrangle very complicated brains, you know? And there's this step where you write down your character defects, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is what you're talking about, all these survival mechanisms that served you very well as a child, but now are obsolete and they're working against you and they are a liability and you're, you know, it's basically like, um, you know, you've got a bunch of like tools and weapons, but the war's been over, yes. right? As uh, the thing that kept me coming back is um, this guy was uh, speaking and he went, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is the war is over. The bad news is you lost. <laughs> so just drop all the weapons, sure. all these maladaptive behaviors, you know, drop the charges. Mm -hmm. And it as I started working more with sponsees and stuff and realizing that, you know, this might um, get me in a little bit of trouble, but it wouldn't be the first time, which is going through and I was like, why do they call them character defects? Like that's just such a negative sure. term. Let's yeah. call them superpowers. And I kind of started getting into this, just even if it's just a thought experiment, you know, anthropomorphizing these character defects, superpowers of, I have this thing where I need to people please. I have this thing where whenever I go see someone, I have to bring them a gift and be overly unctuous. I have this thing where I, is that the caffeine mints? Yes, I think I actually have some if you want some. I got one right here. Um, and, uh, you know, this thing where after I leave a conversation, I have to go over it for 40 minutes and beat myself up. And, you know, I'm obsessed that someone doesn't like me when, in fact, they're not thinking about me at all. <laughs> you know, the narcissism of the I'm a piece of shit in the center of the universe thing, whatever. And I kind of was like looking at a lot of my character defects slash superpowers. And I'm like, a lot of these have served me really well, too. They don't mm -hmm. always serve me well in relationships. They don't always serve me well, but like they serve me really well when I'm at the comedy store at two in the morning and I have or when I'm in business with someone in Hollywood and I'm dealing with a really mercurial person who does have a lot of alcoholic characteristics. Sure. I'm the one that can deal with this person. No one else can. Right. I know exactly like how to keep the room at 68 degrees and just be complimentary enough to this narcissist and kowtow, you know, and so. I was like, maybe it's not about going, everything that happened is all bad. And let me just like over pathologize. Like I like to call it like trauma privilege. Like yeah. just going like, what are the advantages I got from it? Sure. I can radically forgive everything my parents did because we forgive others, not because they deserve forgiveness, because we deserve peace. Forgiveness is selfish. And like maybe just maybe I have a couple advantages because of this, you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And just so that I don't have to look at myself as a victim. And I think the key is kind of going, Okay, to get rid of all these 
maybe it's possible. I'm not going to do psychotherapy. I'm not. I'm not doing it. I just can't. There's certain things. There's certain things that I'm like. I either don't have time to change that about myself, or I don't want to change that about myself, or I'm kind of at a point where I know when to let it serve me, and I know when to. I didn't close the loop on anthropomorphizing it and being able to say like you know what? I don't need that right now. Sure. I'm going to need you to sit this one out. That worked great when I was 10, yeah. but I'm actually on a date right now <laughs> and I need to not have that maladaptive behavior. Sure. But when I'm on set on Monday with that super abusive malignant narcissist, I'll see you there 10 a.m. Sure. You know, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like a weird little exercise that Using I do. Using the traits instead of being used by the traits might be a way to think about it. The genius, of course, you know how to say that. So the perfectionism of, I'm on this date with this guy and I'm obsessing over if my eyeliner is running and he doesn't give a shit, right? But hey, can you come back on Monday, 10 a.m. because I'm editing my special right. and I'm really gonna need you. Right. You know, because sure. everything we have that's maladaptive is trying to protect us. Mm -hmm. It's trying to help us. And sometimes it does. And sometimes it really does. Yeah. You know, the, I think the non-controversial way that people can see this is like uh, with like frugality, mm -hmm. like being frugal is obviously a good trait at the beginning of a career or a life. Right. Understanding yes. the value of money. Yes. Being able to use it effectively, being able to reduce needs, not be wasteful. That's all great. Right. That's how you accumulate. That's how you don't blow through it when mm -hmm. there's not very much of it. The, and and yet if you be, are lucky enough to become successful, if that serves you well and mm -hmm. you save the majority of your salary, you invest it properly, and now mm -hmm. you have lots of it. Yep. What was the point of having lots of it if you cannot spend it? Yep. If you, if $1 still is $1 to you, because mm -hmm. it's not, right? Like $100 was a lot of money at one point in your yeah. life. And now depending on your net worth, a thousand dollars is a lot. Yep. Or $10,000 is a lot, or, mm -hmm. or sorry, is not a lot, right? As uh, if, if you could spend, uh, most people wouldn't think about spending a dollar, and then someone who's worth a lot isn't spending, thinking about spending five hundred dollars mm. or that. And so the ability to update what money means to you mm. and what your actual financial mm -hmm. health or picture is is this ability to update the script and your sense of the world based on the facts as they have changed. Mm. Because otherwise. Again, what was the point of it? Why mm -hmm. did you earn it all if you cannot spend it? Yep. If you're just trying to accumulate the most of it and then you think you take it with you when you die, yep. right? And so you're you at what, because if you don't do that, what you've actually constructed for yourself is a very not nice prison of your own making. Oh my God, I'm so it's sorry. This coaster and I That's are why just we have in a coasters. fight. That just made me think of like really amazing advice I got once about money, which is because I had no idea how it worked. Yeah. Um, and someone, um, this business manager said to me, I mean, I live in California where the taxes are a nightmare. I'm an idiot, obviously. But everything you buy, like if you look at the price tag, it's double what the price tag is sure. based on how much you have to earn and pay taxes on in order to afford it. Right. So if something's $100, just, it's $200. Yeah. If it's $50 sweater, it's $100 sweater. Yeah. Just look at it that way because I could not get out from under money. I mean, the first year that I made any money, I owed tax. I was yeah, in, sure. I lost money on taxes. Like mm -hmm. I had to do 80 cities to pay. Like I had no idea how it worked. Because well, you go from getting a paycheck where it's all being deducted mm -hmm. and then you're getting what seems like a large amount of money yeah. to you. Or not even you send a contract for a large mm -hmm. amount of money. Then actually, it's split over four payments. There's commissions taken out, and then they're like, twelve mm -hmm. months from now, you're gonna have to tell the IRS about it and pay them all at once. And make sure and when, estimated for the next year. It's it's hard. And make sure when you make money. I don't know how I got this like instinct. I think it's because I grew up watching being in such chaos, yeah. being evicted from places, being sent home from school because the tuition wasn't paid. Use the first money you make to make your life better. Hmm. Get health insurance. Sure. Take worries off your plate. Like that's mm -hmm. the best use of money in the beginning. Yeah. Get take your computer to the Apple store and get an update. Get the insurance on your computer. It's <laughs> yeah. like stuff like that that when you buy the purse or buy, you're just adding anxiety to your life sure. and making yourself less functional and less optimal. And it's like spending money on the stuff that's actually going to make it so that you have enough bandwidth to accomplish your goals and dreams. Like this is a really wild thing. My friends make fun of me about it. They go, so I have a, um, a woman that 
is now like my family, Leslie, who is is with me. She'll be helping raise my kid, all that. And she's been with me for 16 years. So I had a cleaning lady when I was 26 years old. I was maybe making $500 a week. And I remember going, I'm never going to make it <laughs> if I don't have a clean. I lived in an apartment in Hollywood. And I was so obsessed with things being clean and there were roaches and it was this like nightmare plate. Mm. And I just was like, I also wore Velcro shoes to save time. Like I was wow. a psych cause I did the math on like, okay, it takes like 30 seconds a day to tie your yeah. shoes <laughs> times 365 days. And I think I also probably wanted a friend and wanted somebody around yeah. and I wanted to learn Spanish and all these other things. But I just was like, I know I'm going to need this and I need it now. And I got her at that time huh. before I had any. And that makes the personal yeah. life more orderly so you could be more chaotic. Instead of and going to clubs work. or going, yeah. you know, whatever, sure. you know, um, that's what I spent the money on. And I do think there was also a little bit of a um, manifesting like I, I deserve, I'm going to start sure. feeling the feelings and living the way that I want to live. They say you're like for a business, you're supposed to hire for what you want the business to be. Yeah, 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 right? totally. Like, like, I was like, I'm going to need one of these one day. Yeah. So I need to get in on the ground floor with her now. Sure. You know, I need to develop this relationship early. Like it was, it's kind of psycho, ground but it did work. Me. I mean, it did sure. work. I wouldn't share any of these like psychotic things I did in my 20s if they I hadn't stuck the landing on them. No, that makes sense. I mean, I, I think about that, like you, you have this sense of what you're like saving for or earning for or whatever. And then that number changes. And so you ha you have to like, I don't know what I was going to say, but I, I was trying, I was trying, I've been trying to adjust and not like if my sense of money or my time value is the same as it was mm -hmm. when I was earning X and now you're earning five X. If yeah. you haven't adjusted that, what was the point of making five X right. more? And also knowing like avoiding crisis. So I think it's like, you know, for artists, for people, like, avoiding a crisis because crisis crises Can are knock you out for a year for a year yeah. so i remember a girlfriend of mine said because i was like i got a savings account and yeah. i have 700 dollars in my savings account and like what should we do for like what vacation should we go on and she went no no, no. savings isn't for fun yeah it's for disaster cavities yeah. Yeah. it's for like mm -hmm. surprise dental stuff it's for someone hit your car and i was like oh you know yeah I found like the other thing I found though that I was doing is and and a wealth person pointed this out to me too. They were like, I was like, well, I I need this in case like it all goes away. I'm doing this in case like the book sales stop. Hmm. Like I was I was only planning for things to get worse. Interesting, right? And he was like, but also your books could sell more copies. He like there was no version in which I was imagining the trajectory continuing. And as you, or going the more up. you write, the better you get. Of course. So how does this? Well, and financially, we know like that actually returns compound. So like like you know if you're half smart and and uh, like half uh, disciplined with your money, you should expect that what you saved is worth a lot ten years from now, or twenty years from now, or thirty years from now, right? But so, but I was only planning for some world in which uh, uh, I was prepared for everything to go away. Hmm. Not like I, I think a normal person has a job and they go, "I'm earning this. If I continue to earn this for this period of time, this is where I can plan my trajectory." But as an artist, there's yep. so much. There's the feast or famine, and then the the not wanting to be the person who thinks it's going to go on forever and then it doesn't. That's interesting. But there's also a world where you're good at what you do and your skills are valuable but and then, you should be able to continue to count on yourself doing the thing. And so it's a tension between feeling like you're entitled to everything and also that you're a piece of shit who's not going to make it. But then it's also, I think, again, going back to the picking the person you look to. Yes. So if you pick the person that was the flash in the pan, ephemeral, I want to be like, I don't know, is Neil Strauss a good example? He like he's not he, a flash in the pan. He, well, didn't he have the the um, book about Negi? I follow him on Instagram. Oh, oh, yeah, so Neil's amazing. He's doing better now, right? <laughs> no, he's, yeah, he wrote the. But didn't he have the with, biggest book ever? The pickup art. The game blew up, but he's also game. like the biggest ghostwriter that there is. <laughs> Spooky. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm trying to think of someone that was like James Frey, a million little pieces. I mean, he ended up being a charlatan. I'm just trying to think of a author. What? Of it. I yeah. see the book behind you. Oh, really? Yeah. 
and it was all a shit. What if it's, I guess he said it was an autobiography, but it was really fiction. Who cares? I'm just trying to think of someone that. Actually, very nice guy. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I'm just trying. This is a to- I'm say. horrible at this. I'm trying to think of of what where you got the idea yes. that you you would yeah, go you, away. You think about the one hit wonders and you go, I don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that. So for me, I was like Rodney Dangerfield, mm-hmm. made it at sixty. Oh, sure. like pick the person, like pick the people you look up to and the trajectories you want to emulate, and don't even think about those mm-hmm. other ones. So I can't even think about a flash in the pan. I'm only sure. thinking of success yeah, stories. Yeah, like yeah, I, I can't it. even like I don't even allow that in my brain, you know? And so for me, I kind of get to go like, oh, I'm, you know, cause working as an actress or working on camera, you're always told like, you got to like 30. Yeah, you start that's, getting that's off. that sort of idea that it, it you start getting the music off. stops for everyone at some point. But like as, as comedians, you just get smarter, you get more interesting, you get more worldly, like the best is yet to come. Yeah. Like this is just the beginning. Sure. It took me a while to like really get in that space. Like what does a 25 year old have to say? Right. Like what do I have to say now? If I'm successful now, like imagine how good I'm going to be sure. in 30 years when mm-hmm. I have a kid and have actually like lived some life. And the audience has grown with you and you've just been doing it forever. And I'm a dork. I mean, literally in my office, I have pictures of, you know, like Rodney Dangerfield and Joan Rivers and all, like remind yourself, make sure you're giving yourself a lot of data and proof that all that's possible. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because I think... You had this joke once I heard you say where you were like, I don't want my phone to get hacked, not because of the pictures that are on, <laughs> because of all the inspirational quotes. On, the, the implication being that there's something kind of lame. Not because of my nudes, because I have a folder full of screen grabs of inspirational quotes. It's brutal. But there is this sense that I think with some people that there's like something wrong with that or that something like a vision board is lame yeah, or that yeah. knowing what you want and trying like there's there's kind of like cynicism is cool and yeah. earnestness is lame. I feel like, you know, yes, I think as you get, I agree on some level, but I committed to not being cool a really long time ago. And, you know, for me, I think it. I just surrender to the fact that really busy brains do well with very clean aphorism, even if it's a platitude, yeah. you know, a very simple one, not my circus, not my monkeys. It's like, that will go out the window for me when I'm go into a chaotic situation and things are crazy and then I'm trying to micromanage people, mother my, martyr micromanage. Those are some things you get when you grow up in alcoholic home. You're trying to fix people. I'm trying to mentor people. And I'm like, none of this is my business or my problem. Yeah. Not my circus, not my monkeys. Oh, right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sometimes mm-hmm. you just like need that like little rubber band snap of a thing. Um, you know, there was one recently that I screen grabbed that intelligent people are being silenced so that stupid people aren't offended. Yeah. You know, like sometimes I just like have to like write it on a post-it note and put it right there when I'm kind of like, oh, is this gonna get me in trouble? And I'm like, oh yeah, like I kind of need those guardrails. It is it, it is interesting. Like first off, there's this debate amongst the Stoics whether these sort of aphorisms or epigrams uh, or maxims as they call them were necessary. Like they were like, the wise person should just know. Like you've learned it, you just know. And and uh, Seneca, one of the other Stokes is like, no, actually you need these like little reminders. And so that's what he was trying to do. He had this exchange with this friend Lucilius. They would write each other letters. Mm. And he says, the whole point of this is he's like, we should each get like one thing a day from each other. Like I'll write you a thing, you write me I a thing. That. And then if there's just one thing that makes you a little bit better, that makes you wiser, smarter, yeah, yeah fortifies you against adversity that's that's what philosophy is yeah and the funny thing is when you look at like high performers that's actually what like if you go to the locker room of the new england patriots there'd be like little things all over inches make champions yes you that you'd go you're getting paid tens of millions of dollars (laughs) a year you're incredibly ambitious and driven you've trained harder had more expert coaching than anyone you should know all this and Bill Belichick is just giving you motivational quotes at the mm-hmm. team meeting, but that's actually what it is at that level, right? Like, th- and people are like, I've been amazed with Daily Stoic and like just the the people who just follow this Instagram ac- account and it's like huge. the like the, Com- the comedians. I had Chris Stefan on my podcast. We were talking about He's all great. my friends that are comics are so obsessed with it, and the, it's obviously genius, you know. But it, the simplicity of it. And the surgical, like there's no fat, the economical nature sure. of like the silver bullet of like, that's what, that's it. Yes. I can't make this quote better. 
my ego can't get around it. I can't be like, Ugh, that's not like it's just true and clean and smart and I can repeat it to someone else. Yes. Like that's the best version of what like religion does. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It just like there's something so soothing about knowing that it's true and it's succinct and I can repeat it to something else and my brain can't overcomplicate it. I have to surrender to it. These ideas, they've been distilled to their mm -hmm. essence by really smart people thousands of years ago. And then the ones that didn't, it's like its like a comedian, the bad jokes get killed, the ones that aren't. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then, and then all the fat, each time you do it, is getting cut out a little bit more. It's being rendered down, yeah. rendered down until all that's left is like the essence of it. And that's the hack of Daily Stoic is that it's posting these things that people have been working on for 2000 years. And it's been true for that long. Yes. And I think comedians probably also just like a very well written line. <laughs> That's There's an appreciation true. for, I think writers too. But we always wanna go like, we'll make fun of it, we'll judge it. We'll be like, oh, well back then they didn't have social media. So it's like, you can't make fun of it. You kind of just get to surrender to it. And there's yeah. something really soothing about that for overthinky, thinky, complicated brains. I remember I talked at the University of Alabama to the football team, this is maybe six or seven, eight years ago. And like, I'm I'm doing the talk, I'm giving my stuff, you know, I'm in my early, tw mid twenties then, I'm talking about ancient philosophy. And I could see this person kind of scribbling the whole time, writing these very, and then they're the first one to stick the hands up. And you know, you can't always tell who people are yeah. from, the lights from the stage or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. the lights come on, it's time for questions. The first person asks a question. That was Nick Saban. Like he was sitting in the front row. There should be nothing I'm teaching this person. Yeah, yeah. He's the greatest to ever do what he does. He's had all the, and there he is. Like, and he's just looking for one little line, like mm -hmm. one little line that he can repeat at something down, that's what he wants. And so it is funny that we kind of like kick ourselves or we think maybe we're even a little self-conscious or we hide it that like, we like these inspirational things. Mm -hmm. one line. But that's what, that's actually the practice of it. And yeah. that's what like great people do is they just look for these little lines that get them to teach something. And that's really what 12 step groups are. It's just a collection you of go lines. Like, I'll take it from here, I got it. Yes. You know, so it's like, there's there's some that bother me. I'm going to be honest. Maybe when someone's like, hurt people, hurt people. I'm like, ah, or like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You're like, or it kills you. Sure. And there's sometimes you have to consider the person that says it, you know, it's yeah. like, you know, you're kind of like, mm, who said that? Okay, well. But it may be true for them or it's true at that moment in your totally. life. Totally. When, the, I mean, it's like, when it's like Marilyn Monroe's like, if you can make a woman laugh, you can make her do anything. And you're like, I feel like that was Bill Cosby's motto, but okay. Like I'm the first person to wanna, you yeah. know, sort of capsize something and, and make fun of it. But yeah, you're exactly right. Like 12 step programs, people go in and they're like, I'm too smart for this. I don't need this and da 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 da. And this doesn't make any sense. And it's like, well, if it's hysterical, it's historical. And you're like, ugh. I just have, that's just true yes. and really helpful. And it's because somebody came, like at some point that was an original line. Mm -hmm. Someone came up with that mm -hmm. or they stole it from someone else and re, they- Yeah, now people know. say it in spin classes. Yeah. And <laughs> but, but like so they they got it from the ancients or they got it from the Bible or mm -hmm. they, re, and, and at, but at some point that quote was not a cliche. Mm -hmm. It was a new way of expressing a thing. And because it struck on something and then it was repeated so many times and it's this process that's working on it that then it becomes like simple, but potentially life-changing advice to someone. Yeah. Like my favorite one along those lines is uh, that I got from meetings I've been to, which was, it works if you work it. Yep. And the idea and of like, worth it. The, the 12 steps are wait, not wait, the we thing. Wait, we weren't allowed to say that in a workaholics meeting. Yeah, I know they have a different <laughs> one. They would joke about how you're not supposed to talk about work positively. Yeah. But, but the idea that like, you know, like stoicism doesn't do anything. Like stoicism doesn't work. Mm -hmm. 12 steps don't work. The Bible doesn't work. Mm -hmm. None of the diets work. Yep. They work if you do the work. They are just the idea. That's right. And so, you know, there's there's just all, all these little lines that capture something that, you know, they're just really helpful reminder. There's, and this is why people tattoo them and put them on the wall or, you know, repeat them or have them as mantras. That's the there's process. There's one that really changed my life. Um, I don't know who said it. Uh, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true. I, now I'm like, that's not true. The way that I play pickleball is not the way that I write books or, you know, whatever. But um, at the time it was like, whoo, yeah, like it really held me accountable. It yeah. really made me want to change. Well, that goes to your thing about the Christmas tree, mm -hmm. that you're decorating the whole Christmas That's tree. Exactly you it. can't go, oh, this doesn't matter. This isn't important. Mm -hmm. And I think like at different, again, at different points in your life and career, you need the right. wisdom of them in different ways. So early on when you're 
you know, prone to cutting corners and not taking things seriously and you only want to do certain things, you need that. Mm-hmm. And then later on, you're like, actually, what's more important? Having a perfect Christmas tree right. or having a happy family? Yes. Like, uh, I, um, I know this woman, her name is Dolores. She's 95. She was telling me her big regret in retrospect was like how clean her house was mm. because she prioritized that over a house well lived in by her family. Yeah. Right. And so But she, that generation of women, I feel like that was your Of course. Draw, they, but you know. but like, hey, is finishing the Christmas yeah. tree, is this you holding yourself to a high standard, mm-hmm. doing things right, or is this you passing on your own is it anxiety or stress to your family? If you're me and yeah. you decorate the tree with everybody and then everyone leaves and then you redo the whole thing, <laughs> that's that's my solution. <laughs> is everyone gets to decorate it and have fun doing your nog and half-assing it and you guys go home and then I just redo the whole thing, Um, which is I very much enjoy. But yeah, I think you go like, okay, am I yelling at everybody because they're doing it wrong and they're not? Or like, am I modeling this for my son that you go all the way around the track and we also decorate the back? You know, I think it's like something I've really learned in programs is about your motives. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain things that you can do with toxic motives and certain things you can do with, you know, benevolent sort of like healthier motives, you know? And you made me think of um, the book, The Tools by Uh Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels, the Uh deathbed exercise, Mm -hmm. which is something that um, I've employed a lot where you imagine yourself on your deathbed. And you go like, do I what, care about this or not? What am I going to regret? And that actually helped me a lot with food stuff, mm. like sort of overthinking and obsessing about food. I, you know, had sort of disordered eating a lot in my 20s. And I, and I was like, oh God, I will never forgive myself if on my deathbed, the same way that Dolores thought about, I wish I hadn't have cleaned my house so much. Yeah. I wish I hadn't have been so obsessed with calories. Right. And like thinking about re- food. Yes. Yeah. Because. I think I've I've come to as a parent realize that a lot of the things you think matter don't matter at all, mm. and like there's a great line from Marx realize is sort of inca- try to I've tried to incorporate into my parenting strategy, which he says, um, you always have the power of having no opinion, right? And how much conflict I think about You're saying that to own, a female comedian. I have good from luck. My own childhood is like. My parents just had opinions about shit Mm -hmm. that wasn't good for them or me or our relationship that now years later, nobody gives a shit about. But like we had knocked down drag out arguments about or just the, the accumulation of the why are your shoes not straight next to the door? Mm-hmm. When I could just pick up my son's shoes and move them if it bothers me instead of choosing to have a fight about this thing, right? Mm-hmm. So the ability to decide, I'm not gonna let this thing bother me. I'm not gonna fight about this thing. I don't need to care. Like I, all the thing, like uh, when when your kid's born, you know, you just, you just walk, all of a sudden you're exposed to all this stuff that you didn't choose to be exposed to. Like mm-hmm. shows they watch, things people say you should, and and just going like, they can enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I don't have to have any opinion on it whatsoever. I don't have to go, this is the worst. Mm-hmm. This is the best. I hate this. It can just be, it can just exist outside me because they're their own person. And then when it comes to the shoes though, yeah, is it, I'm going to just put my shoes straight and that will model it for him? I think so. It's like, hey, look, when we get inside, like our rule is you get inside, you're supposed to go put your shoes in your room, okay. right? And so what matters is do mo- most of the time, do they understand that that's the rule and do they try to do their best to do it? Mm-hmm. That's pretty great, Yeah. right? the time they got excited and came in and kicked their shoes off and then went and had fun and were kids. Do I need to ruin that to mm-hmm. insist on this thing that is not actually the life lesson that I But then the next day, make? are we back to putting them back? I think I, like the other, the other way I try to think about it is like more often than not, Uh huh. right? Like if we can just follow these rules, these ideas more often than not, yep. you're going to be getting the bulk of the wisdom or the importance behind yep. it without having this tyrannical person enforcing you on the time, which is actually having the cumulative long-term impact of making you fucking hate that rule. And then you have to live with the fact that they're just like going to put my thing because you're this monster. I think that, and I don't mean to patronize um, adults, but I do think I've learned so, I wish I had had a kid earlier. 
in a lot of ways, or at least read parenting books, because mm -hmm. I wish, you know, a lot of books about leadership and having employees, I wish I had just read parenting books in a lot of ways, because of so much of it was like, here's all the rules and da 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 da, where, you know, I was reading this book, Hunt, Gather, Parent, which I loved about instead of you know, um, telling your kid, do this and do this, and you need to clean your room. Instead of you need to clean your room, it's let's see how many t-shirts we can get in the hamper yes. in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Like how many things can you turn into a game? How many things can you make fun? Like how can you just not be this draconian, you know, uh, sort of um, cartoon of a yeah. boss, mm -hmm. you know? And I think for a little while I thought like, okay, I'm this young girl that maybe people won't take me seriously. So I have to be really like rigid and, you know, um, let everyone know how in charge I am, mm -hmm. you know, which is not one of the laws of power I know, but um, you know, and then, now it's kind of like, let's see how many jokes we can write. Let's see whoever writes the most jokes. Like, you're not paying for lunch today. Like, how do we just make this more fun? Yeah, I think one of the one of the enemies I've found in life and in parenting is extrapolation. Mm -hmm. So instead of seeing this as the individual instance that it is, you have decided to see it in your head about what happens if I do this or don't do this now, mm -hmm. then tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And they're going to end up being a criminal or a loser yeah, yeah, or yeah. dependent on me yeah. or other parents are going to judge me when it's like, actually what's at stake here is that there are some shoes in the living room. You know what I mean? Which is pretty fucking minor. Is it about the minor. shoes or yeah. is it about, I don't think this kid respects me? Like yes, what's you've extrapolated really going on? out, hey, if I let them do this uh -huh. and it's like, they're not getting away with anything. They're having a hard time. Yeah. They're it's hard to be a child mm -hmm. and they're overwhelmed and they're speaking to you through behaviors mm -hmm. and all you're going is the shoes, the shoes, the shoes, the yeah, shoes. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the shoes don't matter. And in no. retrospect, you in, not only do they not matter now, years from now, they will matter even less to you. And and you will, and your kid, when your kid comes to you and says, why did the shoes matter so much? Yep, yep, that's I have this the whole complex thing. about it. And you're like, I don't care about the shoes at all. And that will be a tragic conversation. I remember one of, this is, uh, the word trauma is really thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. I remember when it was reserved for like nurses and emergency rooms, but- Yeah, or I, gaping war wounds. I, exactly, <laughs> but maybe this is just something I really remember a very frustrating thing as a child. And it stuck with me and- um, for lack of a more elegant way to put it, did mess me up for a while. Um, my mom was always obsessed with don't mess up your pantyhose. Yeah. Which I don't even know why I was wearing- Like tears in them and- Why was I wearing pantyhose? I was yeah, right. five. I'm right. gonna mess them up. Yeah. I'm five. Yeah. I don't know if we have an appointment at Epstein Island later <laughs> or why I'm even in these, but it was like picture. We had like a family photo day and yeah. I was wearing these white hose with a dress and I had the pink to the whole whatever. And, um, you know, there was a lot of keeping up the Joneses yeah. in my family. We have to have this portrait and this photographer and we have to have this frame and we're a perfect family. Mm -hmm. And um, and what does a kid do at five if you're out in a park taking photos? You have two, and I'm like, run, and of course I run, skid my knees and, you know, bleeding through the white hose, of course. And and she was so stressed out. I remember we'd go to the bathroom, take my pants, flip them around, right? So yeah. that the blood was like on the back. And I just, and I remember as a kid just being like, why, like, how can this matter so much? Mm -hmm. And then later in life, I'm of course obsessed with my clothes and obsessed with my hair and obsessed with how I look all, you know, all the time. And I um, also hunt, gather, parent, I'll bring up again which is I see a lot of my friends, not that I'm a stellar parent, haven't had one yet, check back with me when I'm actually at the playground. Yeah. But like what we, I see them with their kids, playground was don't touch, make sure and you're gonna be careful, you're gonna hurt yourself on that. Mm -hmm. And I see the kid look at them like, well, why are we here? Sure. If it's so dangerous, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the yeah. hunt gather parent is all about like, wait until they're in actual danger and then you just have to watch them, but you like sort of let them go a little bit. And granted, playgrounds aren't as dangerous as they used to be when we were kids, you know, but instead of just warning them about a bunch of nebulous dangers that are around, just kind of let them figure it out and protect them when there's actually a threat. My wife and I were talking about this the other day, like remembering what a big deal it was slash like problem it was if you poked a thumbtack in the wall to like hang up a poster. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like the 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 respect for sheetrock as yeah. a child yeah. was like in <laughs> retrospect totally out of proportion. Like yeah. insane. As 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 though that's not like a little dab of uh of of something you buy at Home Depot. Yeah. As if they didn't repaint the house like multiple times. And then uh, zooming out, I go, what? 
you don't even live in that house anymore. Yeah. You sold it. And and at no point was the buyer walking around Mm-mm. going like 10% less yep. because your child had heavy metal posters up at some point. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And so this preservation, this protection of yeah. stuff at the expense of peace and tranquility mm-hmm. or just positive interactions. Mm-hmm. And then also later, like the expressions of creativity and fun, like, uh, if you walk through my garage and in my son's closet, there's like, he drew all over it. He shouldn't have done that. I put on a jacket the other day and I realized he'd drawn all over it with Sharpie. <laughs> and like, that was frustrating in the moment that he did that because like I told him to be careful with the Sharpie and to not get it on me and he did it. But when I put it on the other day, I I felt no anger. But I like, felt, is it on you for having a Sharpie and not a waterproof thing? Or like a like I mean, a you just took a Sharpie off my desk. Okay. You know? but, but like, the, I was like upset in that moment. Yeah. And then when I put on the jacket, what I thought it looks was, cool. <laughs> I remember the four-year-old who did this, that four-year-old doesn't exist anymore. That four-year-old is gone. I will never have that four-year-old again, right? Because they're six now and they turned seven on this weekend, right? And so, so the idea of like the thing matters to you in the moment, you think yeah. it does, but you objectively in not very long, you will be missing this exact thing or you will be uh, walking. I walk by the garage and I see that and I go, that was so cute. Why? Like, no one will care about this. So it's like having hindsight right now. It's yeah, like just finding go, a way just to have stop, it. Stop trying to preserve and protect and keep everything the way that it is. There's a, a I think, a, a letting go that needs to happen if you want to, yep. if you want to have peace and happiness in your house, but also not, not make them feel like things that don't matter matter a great deal something i just read in i want to say raising resilient kids maybe the name of the book i just don't want to plagiarize anybody or act like it's my wisdom here Uh, i know nothing about parenting that when a kid comes to you and tells you i you know i broke something right the first thing you should say is thank you so much for telling me Mm -hmm. so that they learn not to keep secrets from you you know that's actually you know like they go you know george washington didn't actually chop down the cherry tree you know that story no so that there's this there used to be a story they would teach in school that George Washington chopped down a cherry tree. Okay. And then he he told the truth about it. Okay. That's the the lesson. Like nobody at that time thought George Washington actually chopped down this cherry tree. The point was he chopped down this prized cherry tree. And then his father said, who did this? And he was honest enough. That was lesson one of the story. Like George Washington he cannot tell a axe. lie. He's, He's like, like <laughs> oh, I did it. But the other, le- the actual lesson of the story is he didn't fear reprisals from his father for telling the truth. Mm-hmm. It's a two-way street, yep. right? It's not like George Washington said, I, you know, I throw myself on the mercy of, you know, yeah. the parental authority. Um, he he understood, hey, if I'm honest about it, mm-hmm. like we tell our kids that all the time, we just want to know what happened. Like, you're, like your brother is crying. Yeah. It's, we obviously know you're involved, <laughs> but if you could tell us what happened, we could just get to the bottom of it and resolve it faster, you know. And <laughs> we know you're involved. It's <laughs> the two of you. We know you're involved. I um, my dad accidentally did something really genius one time. I, I you know, I I think he did a lot of great things, but you know, that generation, it's like his dad was in a war, and you know. And um, I like to, is radical forgiveness, but this is something that might come off. People might say this is like horrible parenting, but he had a very, I think, healthy relationship with human nature, probably very much on the cynical side, but he used to pound into me like life's not fair. Yeah, He'd be like, you're going to have to work twice as hard to get half as far. He would wake me up in the middle of the night and quiz me on spelling words. Like he was like, he was like, and I'm like, why are we doing this now? And he'd be like, because like on the day of the test, yeah. you're not going to, there could be a siren that could go by. You could have a crush on a boy and it distracts you. You could be hungry. Like he would always, you know, want to put me in, you know, w- wild situations. Like he would put um, my favorite show at the time when I was Beverly Hills 90210 and he would quiz me on history stuff while mm-hmm. my favorite show was on and I wasn't allowed to watch, you know, like he kind of really believed I was going to be at a disadvantage in the world. Mm. Um, and so he was really strict in a lot of ways, but also really absent in a lot of other ways. And I remember he had kind of really lost control of of me and my other sibling, like by the time we were in high school. And he would like buy us cigarettes. He was like, I know you're going to do this, so let mm-hmm. me just do it because I don't want you to go ask some guy, go get a fake ID and sure. ask some man to buy you cigarettes. You know, like that was kind of his logic. Yeah. 
And there was something kind of genius about it because it took the sex appeal out of it. You're kind of like, well, I don't want cigarettes if you're going to buy. The whole point is to do it secretly and hide it or whatever. But he said, I remember when I was like 14, he was like, I know you're going to drink. I know you're going to smoke weed. I know you're going to experiment with all this. He goes, so if you get in a car with someone who's drunk driving or stone driving, yeah. you're never going to leave the house again. Okay. And then had like a really intense threat about yeah. if it was a boy. But if you just call me. Yeah. And tell me to come pick you up. Yeah, you will no have zero punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Zero. Right. And one night, I remember I was in um, Bethesda, Maryland. This guy was drinking, gets in the car, put a quarter in the thing. It's like pay phones or something at the time. And I called and I was like, dad, someone's drinking. He came and got me. Didn't say a word. That's great. And I was wasted. And it was like probably not good parenting, but I never lied to him. Yeah. He made it so that his teenage daughter never lied to him. Yes. And I didn't get in a car with that guy. Who's, and, the, who's the comedian that was going to do a special with a streamer and then he bought it back and did it himself? Uh, Andrew? Andrew Schultz? Schultz, yeah. I heard him tell this story on this podcast, on a podcast once, where he was saying like, he was driving to school with his dad and uh, his dad goes, hey, did you do your homework? And he was, this may have even been on your podcast, actually. Maybe. Uh, and he was like, did you do your homework? And he's like, no, I didn't. And he expected, you know, telling his dad was going to get mad. He's going to yeah, get in trouble. Yeah. He's going to get grounded. And his dad just said, um, do you want to stop and do it? And he was like, yeah, sure. Huh. And they stopped and did it, like on, Whoa. like in the car on the side of the road. And he, he was talking about how he thinks back to that moment all the time. Because it could have been a fight. It could have been an argument. It could have been a, I'm trying to impotently enforce my authority on yep. this person who's getting older and more independent or it could just be a a We're lesson teen. of like it's not too late no like you could still do this let's just do it yep do is your heart in the right do you want to do you want to be a person who didn't do their homework or mm -hmm. do you want to be a person who did the homework and just like it's never too late to make the right choice yeah and then you That's just cool. made the right choice and then they went to school and what a sort of powerful lesson that is not just in that individual instance, That's but cool. going forward. And so I just try to think about Should stuff we do it like now? that. That's really cool. Yeah, how much low, how much lower key that is. And but also if we do it now on the side of the road, You'll next time you're gonna be like, I, I'd rather have done this the night before. Totally. When I had more, you know? Yeah. And you might not get it. I, I think letting people have consequences is like a real big one. There's a book I'll give you in there. I have, have you read Jessica Leahy's The Gift of Failure? I don't think so. Oh, it's incredible. It's a it's a parenting I book. I know. But it's, it's, this, a, it's this idea of like, you never want your kids to be embarrassed or fail or so you're like, oh, sorry, I'm running across town because you forgot your lunch or like you reminded them 50 times and now you're doing their no. science fair project is just the idea of like, life. I'm not getting an F on the science project. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> life, life is about consequences for decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard as a parent. You never want the... the snowplow parenting or helicopter parenting it's it comes from a good place it's not wanting people to feel distress or pain right the people you care about the most who who in some ways it's like your heart running around outside your body and and yet you're actually causing them much more pain in the long run by not letting them fail. Like in that story, they understood, he's like, do you want to? It's your choice. It's also insulting. I mean, we say in ACA, like when you help other people, you're not giving them the dignity of their own experience. Mm -hmm. You're saying like, you're not capable of this, so I'm gonna do it for you. Also, you're not capable of dealing with the consequences. Like you're too you're fragile. This will growing. break you yeah. to uh, go without a lunch and or i think i'm embarrassed to have a kid that didn't finish his homework well that's that's the root of so much is that it? it is i'm afraid it's going to make me look like a bad parent it actually has nothing to do with being a good parent i'm worried it's going to make me look bad mm -hmm. is that part of it like the ego of that well there's a really revealing moment to me you know the college admissions scandal where those parents were like <laughs> putting their kids in canoes in front of a green screen <laughs> yeah exactly Obsessed. well so one of them there's this they have these wiretaps on these parents and they heard one of the parents talking about it, and he basically says oh, something cringe, like cringe. he's like i can't have my son go to asu wow because a, even though ASU is actually a great school and lots of people come there and there's nothing wrong with it especially wow. if the kid wants to go but it's and he, you know, he's not saying, oh, my son's not going to thrive at ASU. He's not going to learn things at ASU. But he's saying, I can't have my son go to ASU. So you realize Gross. that has nothing to do with the kids at all. Um, like two of the other revealing ones is one is uh, Lori Laughlin's kid that's in it. 
she had like a successful YouTube channel that was yeah. making, that was beyond success. She didn't even need to go to college. And then the other one, I guess it's a Hollywood thing, really. Felicity Hoffman's daughter wanted to go to Juilliard where you don't have to have SAT scores to get in or not. Huh. So she cheated on the SATs for a thing that did not even matter for what she was what her daughter wanted but to Rick do. But Rick Singer just wanted to charge No, she, more? you want to, you don't want to have a kid. You want to have a kid SATs. that has a good SAT score, right? Like you want to have a kid who, you don't want to have a kid who's, I'm not taking the SAT, I'm only going to an acting school or hmm. whatever, right? It's so much about your kid being a reflection of you, which is so, your kid is not a reflection of you, positive or negative. Hmm. And the ability to separate that is like, like I, you know, your kid's freaking out of the supermarket. Yeah. Your kid is freaking out at the supermarket. Yeah, I don't know that guy. <laughs> like <laughs> they they are the yeah. one, you are being a parent. Yeah, yeah. And they are go and and actually also understanding that they're not having a good time. This yeah. is horrible for them. Well, it's also that's that's really interesting. Like there you know, and I, I'm I'm curious, I'll probably be asking you for a lot of advice, sort of vacillating back and forth of like it's not your job to entertain your kid. Like it's it's good to take them along to do adult things, but also knowing like yeah, this is boring as shit to a kid, Yeah, you know? And um, I was reading about this like game you can play with them at the grocery store where when they want something, you can take a picture of it and yeah. go like, oh, we'll send this to Santa. Do this all the time. Right? Yeah. So that they're you're not saying no all the time. Like, how can you not say no? Because grocery stores are basically the no store yeah. for kids. Well, it's also understanding what they don't understand. So mm -hmm. like they don't understand that they're seeing this thing and they want it. And yep. you're saying, no, you can't have it. But they're hearing, no, I can't have this forever. Mm -hmm. And it's disappearing into a black hole because they don't remember anything. I'm never anything. gonna see these Fruit Loops again. Yeah, and it's like, I, they don't know that you know that this stuff is always at the grocery store. Yes. Or that you can remember and things. And these freaking companies put the good stuff <laughs> low on purpose. Or, or also that there's actually better things. They don't know any of this. So when yes. you so when you just go no, you don't know that want, all that gives you cancer yet. <laughs> all, all your want your your wants or desires are wrong and incorrect. Instead of going, oh, you want that? Okay, we'll take a picture of it. We'll talk about it later. Or or like we realize like with the screen, like when we're turning it off, because they don't remember things and they can't type in to go back to the video they were watching. Mm. The video is disappearing forever. Wow. And so to say, oh, we're pausing it. And then I'm going to take a picture of it and we can come back to this exact point in this video at a later time. And they're like, oh, OK. They have never once, once asked to go back to it. It was just the immediate distress of not wanting this thing that they're caring about in this moment to disappear. How did you forever. figure that out? Just common sense? I'm sure my or... wife picked it up in a book. And then, okay. you know, where most of these things come from. Um, it is a little bit like, duh, it's still in the cloud. Like yeah, it's, but they, but they, <laughs> they don't know that. But they can't be like, oh, yeah. I'm at 423 in this video titled X. Yes. And I could, so, so I think I just spent, I just, I've spent a lot of time just thinking about what it's like to, like, it's hard to be me. So it's definitely hard to be mm -hmm. a child. I remember, it's definitely hard to be my child. To live in my house in my life. how frustrating it was to be a kid when no it's one insane. took you seriously. And you just wanted to be older and you like couldn't articulate your feelings. I remember being so I remember I used to walk around with books hoping yeah. that people would take me more seriously. Like as a kid, sure. my dad had these art books and I would like walk around with them, like pretending like I was reading them. I didn't know just to try to be taken seriously. Well, there's a German word, it's umwelt, and it's like someone or something's sense of the world. Right. Hmm. So what is it like to be a bat? Right? What is it like to be a dog? Ooh. What is it like to be a kid? So here's one that kind of blows your mind is to go. This kid fell asleep in my arms or fell asleep in their car seat or fell asleep nursing. And then I picked them up and I put them in their crib and I turned off the lights and they fell asleep and they were asleep for four hours. Yeah. And then they woke up in pitch blackness. What do they think about what? Do they think that they died? Mm -hmm. Do they think that they ex are now in some netherworld? Yeah. Is it like, why is there darkness? Mm. Where am I? Who am I? What has my mother and father disappeared? Like, you just think about how insane that is. Mm. And so, so if that's in, if that pretty run of the mill thing, like even my four year old, he once told me he thinks he can teleport because he falls asleep in the car or he falls asleep in our bed and then he wakes up in his bed. How does this happen? Because no, I don't wake him up as it's happening and going, I'm picking you up and moving your rooms. So your their lack of understanding about things that are happening 
creates mm. distress because they're coming up with explanations for why things are happening. And a lot of their explanations are preposterously stupid. Yeah. Or um, they explain the world in a way that would be alarming and confusing. And so when you when you can just go like, oh, yeah, what's it like to be you? It's a lot. Gosh, I that even I want to apply that to adults sure. that you're working with. And you're like, how does this person not? It's like when people are like, how could you vote for that person? I'm like, how can you not see how that person would vote for that person? Ask them four questions and it's pretty easy to do the forensic. Well, the other one I've come around on is like you go trust the process, like put in the work, trust the process, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I trust the process because I have been through the process. Yeah. It has paid off for me. Hmm. Right. Like I know when I start a book, I feel like X. Then there's the midpoint where I feel like terrible. Then I start to get excited. I know I know the process. Yeah. So I trust it. It's yeah, paid yeah. Off. You know, like the harder it gets, the closer you are in a weird way. Yeah. And like just think about the things you're asking people, your kids, strangers to just understand the the amount of assumptions that are baked in to your view on this thing. It's totally unfair. And if you could explain it or speak more from experience, it would be so much less painful, scary, distressing. You'd also give people passes, you know. You're also making me realize something that is, I'm just gonna say it, even if it, it might feel like a tangent, that the kind of people listening to this podcast, you, people in program, people that have worked really hard on yourselves, people that are smart, that are quick, we sometimes come off like bullies and it's hard for me sometimes like it's a, an adage that helps me is when you get healthy the sick get angry mm. when you try to set a boundary or try to like you know have some you know cogent wisdom or or trying some other thing and people are like what do you do? and you're like how do you not get and you're like oh like like all of this might come off as dismissive to yes. someone that doesn't know a lot about it yes you know, and it's so obvious to us, but sometimes when I'm in conflict about something and someone's like, well, I don't understand what you're saying. And I'm like, oh, we're just like vibrating at different frequencies. Like working with prey animals has really helped me with that, of just realizing that sometimes like how clear we are, how ambitious we are, how direct we are, comes off to other people, sometimes aggressive, sometimes like pressure, mm -hmm. sometimes arrogant. Yeah. And like, you're just a fucking know-it-all. Yeah. And it's taken me, a, it's fun to be able to sit here with you and just like, -da -da, here's all these things, you know? Sure. But like, I find myself sometimes talking to people, I'm like, and I read this parenting book, and and I'm just like, so maybe insecure about how unintelligent I am that I want to know everything. But then sometimes I go out in the world and I have to just be like, just be a person. You don't have to teach everyone all the time. You're not on a podcast. You don't have to show off how much you know. Sure. Like sometimes you gotta just like pump the brakes a little bit and be okay with knowing stuff and not forcing it on everybody and just kind of walk the walk instead of talk the talk. One of the things I got from my wife is she'll say like, it's okay that you're scared to our kids. She's like, I'm not scared. Mm -hmm. I've done this many times. I know how this works. Yeah, It's okay for you to be scared, but just know that I'm not because I have a different set understanding or knowledge or experience here. And this idea that it's like, your emotions are your emotions. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to feel them. There's there's nothing wrong about them. But I just want, maybe it would be comf comforting or important for you to understand that I'm not feeling the same emotions. So you, if you're if you're scared because you think this is a scary situation that everyone is terrified mm -hmm. of, that's you're gonna react to that differently than I'm scared because this is new, yeah. but my mom or my dad is not scared because they've been here before. Mm -hmm. So you could see a CEO comes in and goes, hey, you may have heard all this stuff that's happening in the news. Yeah. People think we're going out of business or people think this is gonna be the worst business environment. Mm -hmm. But hey, I've been doing this 40 fucking years. Yeah. I've been through this exact thing a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be fine. And if it's not fine, I'll communicate that to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you'll be the first to know. Yes, and that that that's, um. there's another book in there I'll give you. Uh, have you read Dr. Becky yet? Oh, she's oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I follow her on Instagram. Yeah. She's like, it's called Love emotional her. vaccination. Yeah. Oh. Just like communicating. Yeah. These are the emotions you're likely to feel in this situation. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about it. Think about it. You may still feel them anyway, mm -hmm. but like they don't have to surprise you and they're definitely not surprising me.
And something that helps me, and maybe this is like, it's something we say in program when you're talking to a sponsee who's newer than you, you say, wait for the question mm -hmm. before you start throwing advice out. Like, wait, just wait for the question before you start going, well, you know what, you should do this and this and this. It's a small thing, but just saying like, you know what works for me? Yeah. Might not work for you. Yeah. But like, probably will. But like, sure. you know what works for me? Yeah. You know, and just kind of like- Just being a little When I've been scared wait. like that in the past, this is what worked for me. I've been through this before, what worked for me. So you're not just like going, I felt what you felt. I, I know more than you and here it is. I think it's like taken me a second sometimes because I remember um, I had this therapist say to, say to me once, she was like, careful how much you grow because there's going to be less and less people sure. that you it's can lonely. vibrate with. <laughs> Things are going to start getting lonely. There's a story I tell in The Obstacles Away about Phil Jackson. He He's coaching the Lakers and he gets this back surgery and because of the back surgery, he he can't stand on the sideline. He has to sit, mm. and like it's he has to sit like one row back. He can't he can't sit in like a low chair. He has to sit in a high chair, like up off the ground, uh, to see the game. And so he thinks it's gonna totally fuck up the team because the coach can't go from player to player. He can't be pacing with. And in fact, sitting up in the chair a little bit back from everyone makes everyone kind of come to him. Yep. And it changes the energy and it changes his viewpoint. And he realized it's a kind of the Zen idea. He's expressing that like, actually, I think I need to be up in everyone's face, very proactive, but in fact, stepping back and letting people come to you, it actually unlocks this other kind of learning and teaching and a, an element to the relationship. And so you, sometimes you think you gotta do X, but actually you just gotta go, Use your emotions, I understand them, I'll let you have them, come to me if you need anything. Mm -hmm. I'll be modeling over here what I think should be happening. And that's just a, 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 a slightly detached is a word that we don't like, but it's actually a more detached approach in a good way. There's a word that I love that I think people don't use a lot. And it's something that I've learned from this dog trainer that helped me with, when you have really big, powerful dogs, um, you don't walk around dogs, you walk through dogs. Mm. So if you've got a big dog who's right in front of you, you're not gonna kick them, you're not, but you gotta walk through them. They always have to get out of your way, always, 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 right? Mm. Or else they start to know they're in charge. In the beginning, they can't sleep with you, da, da, da. And it's very simple. He's like, you need to be regal. Mm. Be regal. Sure. Same with horses, prey animals. They're trying to figure out who's in charge. And if you're here, you're just asking for permission all the time, yeah. right? And if you're here, you're being regal. So that is something when I walk into situations, it's such a dorky thing to be like, be regal, be regal. But like sometimes sure. you just have to cheat it a little bit with your body because your body's mm -hmm. set, your body and what you're wearing already communicates everything before you say a word. Yeah. Yeah, that was the last thing I wanted to ask you about. Like uh, we have this ranch, like maybe 25 minutes from here. It's where we, we spend most of our time. And like, I find like, cause I have that sort of energy of like wanting to do things and be driven and needing to prove it. And then when you're around animals and they're just present, they're not comparing themselves to other animals. They don't feel good or bad. They mm -hmm. just are. And there's a stillness to that. And I'd say specifically prey animals. What's a prey animal? So prey animals, so predators, like dogs, right, cats, yeah. have a different thing. And then prey animals, basically everything boils down to them is fear or absence of fear. So when you're like, I'm gonna rush, I have to do yeah, something. They're sure. just like, is there a bobcat? Is there a mountain lion? Yeah. That's all it boils, because they don't have, mm. they're so, like relentlessly in the moment yeah. and because they're energy conservationists, because they're grazers, right? They yeah. only get to eat the grass that's around. Yeah. So they're not gonna waste a bunch of time being needy or desperate if you know they don't know when their next patch of grass is gonna come. Like they yeah. have to be energy conservationists, sure. right? And then any kind of anxious energy, like if you're walking up to a horse trying to get a selfie, Right. Sure. Ultimately, what you're saying is, I'm afraid I'm not gonna get this selfie. Sure. And then they're like, Why are you in fear? I gotta go look for the mountain lion. Yeah. Right. Like they don't understand fear. They don't understand insecurity. It all boils down to there's a predator close by. Yeah. So there's this incredible thing that happens with prey animals if you really like work with them in a fair, egalitarian way, where you want to be in a partnership with them, where they just become a mirror to you. Mm. So the first thing we do in like a gala, which is like horse therapy stuff, is just you and the horse in an arena. And you try to see if you can have appealing enough energy that it wants to be near you. Oh. Because their only reward is serenity. If there's no grass around. Right, right. Whereas dogs, their reward is food. I mean, look, sure. I love dogs. I'm a dog person. But like my dog will jump in someone else's car. Yeah, sure. And go home with them yeah, yeah. and be totally fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm sure when they see me again, they'll, you know, but like like horses, prey animals, like their only reward is serenity. And then if you're gonna do grooming and stuff like that, it's different. But if you can get a prey animal 
to want to hang out with you. Yeah. They, cause they can read your thoughts. They can read your mind. They can read your energy. So it's really fascinating to watch if you're standing next to a horse and they're just hanging out with you. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, what if it walks away? What if it, what if it stops wanting to hang out with me? And then it just walks away. And you're like, God damn it. They just walked away. What did I do wrong? And then yeah. they walk even further away. And then you're like, you know what? I have this itch on the back of my neck and I'm just going to take care of it. And I'm not going to think about anything else. And I'm going to make sure there's no predators around. And all of a sudden they're right next to you. So when you're obsessing about them, thinking about them, worrying about them, it's just like a really great way to learn your inner monologue and the kind of energy you're giving off. Yeah. Because, you know, when you see people that are the leaders and they walk into work and they're like, why is everyone in such a bad mood? And you're like, yeah, yeah like you, you just showed up. You did that. Yeah, I remember when we first got our donkey, we bought this donkey on Craigslist Donkeys are for a hundred awesome. bucks. And for a hundred bucks? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you paid too much. <laughs> yeah, most of the time they're free they, yeah. or they come with the land because they're so great. you're supposed to have them. They're just livestock guarding animals. And yeah, that's they, what it, they stomp coyotes. They're awesome. And so I, I remember he's just standing there. Like he's just standing there in the middle of this field. And I remember going sort of like laughing, like what a dumb animal. He's just sort of standing Ugh. there. And then I go, wait, that's his job. His job is literally just to stand there, to not be dead. Mm -hmm. And by standing there and being in himself, mm -hmm. he's keeping other things away. What would have made you think he was smart? You know. You want him to be I, like building well, a. No, like uh, when he's um, opened gates and tried to get into our house. You know, when he, like when they're doing sort of mischievous, intentional yeah. stuff, that feels that like feels like a sign of intelligence. That's re that's actually restless and maladaptive. Yeah, but just the idea that like, you know, say like, you know, I'll say this in programs like human uh, being, not human doing, mm -hmm. but like the animal doesn't have any sense of that. It just, I am doing it's what happy. I am doing. Yeah. And that that's a pretty magical, wonderful place it's to It's like, be. You do, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm yeah. in this awesome pasture, I've got grass, because if I open that, there could be a, a mountain lion on the other side of that. Or if I bite this thing, I could break my tooth or yeah. I could be near predator. You know what I mean? Unless they need to look for water or something like that. They're very much like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. You know, and that's like and they're by default serene. Yeah. So when you come in with some wild energy, but it's it is, you know, what is it again? The um, empathizing with someone else's state, the German word. Um, well, um, well. I also love working with prey animals because prey animals always have their eyes on the side of their head. Right. Predators yeah. are forward. Yeah. And the first thing everybody does when they see a donkey or horse, what do they do? They just go yeah. right to the head, which yeah. is this is the one place in the between their eyes that they can't see. And horses always pull away. So understanding like it's been how in, they perceive the world. That's you walk yeah. up next to them. You ask permission. Th this is how they see the world. Know how they see you yeah. and then learn their body language instead of expecting them to understand English or whatever. Right. You know, when you see people talk to their dogs, like, yeah. what did I say? Yeah, right. What did we talk about yesterday? And you're yeah. like, do you really think like, you know, so it's been a great exercise to surrender because you have to take language out of it. And mm -hmm. working with prey animals makes you realize how much how first of all how full of shit we are how yeah. in congress what we're saying and how we're saying it is which is mm -hmm. why it's like great to work with like young girls and boys but working with young girls and horses because if you're going like no stop that's not no right Do you know what i mean you're saying it with your body and you're claiming your space and sort of you're it's about saying what you're saying say what you mean mean what you say don't say it mean but mean what you say with your body right your body language matters so much more than what you're saying right. so a lot of i see a lot of bosses where your employees don't respect you or you're not getting what you want because you're like if you guys could just get that done today like you know by five like that'd be great like you're being wishy-washy like what do you say what you're saying or what? when someone's like yeah no i like it and you're like do you think i didn't notice that i, I can't i don't believe you yeah like it makes you realize how full of shit we are. Well, to go back to full circle, the can canceling or rescheduling, the other one I like is like, um, don't say maybe when you want to say no. Mm -hmm. Right? Like this isn't a consent issue. I'm just saying like, mm -hmm. if someone's like, hey, you want to go out tomorrow? You want to do this thing? And if you're like, ah, let me see, let me check. Just be like, fucking no. Like yeah. not interested, hard pass. It, right? Like yeah. be, be clear about what you want to do and what you don't want to do or what you like and you don't like. I just don't, do don't the, defa sorry. the defaults no. Like yes. just start with no. Yes. Like no is a complete sentence. Yeah. But but just to don't to, say sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. You know, don't say sorry. Just say no. Or and don't make an excuse first. This because is maybe you're something you're asking people to argue with you. I think you this might have been something I heard on your podcast and it changed my life. Because I have a couple by my computer, a couple things that are written out. 
I'm at capacity at the moment. Mm. I will let you know if that changes. Sure. I'll let you know. Yes. Don't follow up with me. Because this yeah. is someone I think on your podcast might have said this that is like, um, uh, no, I can't. I'm busy this week. Yeah. Oh, so next what week? about next week? Yeah. Oh, right. You know what I mean? Just trying do to make this go away. Yes. Totally. Yeah. And then if they respond again, yeah. you just I'm not sure. responding. Sure. You know what I mean? You also know response is a response. Yeah. You know, I kind mm -hmm. of always forget that. And if someone's just like a bugaboo, they just, you know, they'll never understand. And that's, you know, boundaries, something that I love from ACA is like boundaries are for us and not them. So you can set one verbal boundary, but if they keep crossing it, then you just no contact. Yeah. Also, you don't owe anyone any responses or explanations, no. which is very empowering. Just because you just got an email. You doesn't mean you don't have to fucking RSVP, yes or no. Mm -mm. Not interested, not interested. No one cares. Yeah. No one cares. They're yeah. not going to cancel the party because <laughs> yeah. you didn't respond. Right. And if they are, they'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, hey, this is only about you. Only, like, mm -hmm. And if they don't, then it's a manipulative weird thing, which you shouldn't go to anyway. Yeah. Like, I, I can't make it. Thanks for asking. Like, yes. it's just very simple. Well, this is the wonderful thing about having kids is it gives you some real clarity and realizing, I'll show you my office. I want to make this. I don't want to come. I I'm I do have kids, but that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> like well, I'm, true. I'm so like relentlessly honest at this but point. But I, I have uh, a picture of my oldest, and then I have a picture of my youngest, and then in the middle, this sports psychologist named Jonathan Fader gave me this picture, and it just says no. And and it's realizing that when I'm saying yes to you, I'm saying no to these two people yeah. who I already promised pretty much all of my spare time. You can also think of it as like my nightmare is that someone comes to my birthday party who's like oh because they didn't want to be there fine. oh god we have to stop by whitney because you know if we don't like that's so embarrassing to me it's horrible so i never want to do that to someone else if i'm yeah. like i gotta go to this thing so it's like if you're doing something out of obligation get out of there yeah. they don't want you to be there either yes or if they do it's not a person you yeah want. when someone comes up it's like hey i can only be here for 10 minutes and you're like why did you come right this is embarrassing we would have been fine without you like the self-importance of like if i don't show up sure. i guess the, they're just going to cancel the party like what do you think is going to happen like the self-importance of that but well, i did a grow up watching a mom go to four christmas parties a night we got to stop here we got to stop here we got to stop here and like all that shit. that's the ego of that imposter syndrome too which is like no one's trying to see if you have what it takes or not they're they're feeling that about themselves. Like no one yeah. has enough time to think about whether you're qualified to do what you're doing. Interesting. Also, this is some weird addiction or trying to get out of your feelings and I don't want to participate in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like someone who's like, I want to come. And then the day of, they're like, I don't know if I can make it. And they're like, is what? And you're just like, blah. Yeah, I don't need any of this. Show up or not. I don't need or not. any of this. Yeah, right. What? This has nothing to do with me and you're making my life harder. Yeah. Yeah, and, and kids kids give you some clarity on this because you realize who is being affected by mm -hmm. your shit. Yes. Right? Or by your overcommitting, mm -hmm. by your social anxiety, by your uh, inability to say no, mm. you know, by, uh, you know, your drama, by your lack of, like, someone is bearing the cost of all of this. That you're like... You you can you can do as much shit as you want to yourself. Yeah. But now you brought in these other people who you owe slightly better to, and like so if you can't say no to you because yeah. you don't want to be rude, you don't want to be rude. You have to understand that you've it's already rude made to say it, yes when you're lying. <laughs> but but you've already like there's no way out of this that is not rude. Yeah. Right. So like if if someone <laughs> has asked you to do something and you don't want to do it, you don't want to hurt their feelings, so you say yes. You hurt these other two, you hurt a seven-year-old's feelings. But if someone invites you to something and it hurts their feelings, they're mentally ill. That's right. not an adult. But, but when you, it's like, you don't want to, you don't want, like in the scenario where you don't want to bear the bad news to someone, mm -hmm. even though it's not actually bad news, yeah, but yeah, you yeah, don't want to say, you don't want to say the words no. Yeah. So you go, yes. yes. Well, you are saying no. You're just yeah. saying no to them, mm -hmm. but they don't have the ability or the power the understanding mm -hmm. to be like, mom, why, mom or dad, why are you saying no to playing right now? Why am I at the babysitter's? And why then when you're I, on your deathbed, are, are you going to be like, thank God I went to that thing instead of hanging out with my kids? Exactly. And, you know, this is, I just want to pay card where credit's due and name drop. Um, the singer Sia um, said to me once, because I, you know, struggle with some codependent stuff when we were talking about it. And she goes, before I say yes to a plan, I ask, what's in it for me? Sure. And it, I, I, it like blew my mind that being selfish is kind of selfless, you know, kind of thing. It was like, 
I didn't even think of that. I like it never occurred to me that yeah. it's like, oh, I might run into some people I want to talk to. I I just like no, I have to deliver this gift and I have to show up and I have to entertain everyone and I yeah, we're a friend, so I don't want her to think her friends to think I didn't show up to her party and that I, we're not friends. Like I just was I couldn't think of I'm like if I can't think of a couple things that's in it for me, mm-hmm. I just can't do it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And it's and again, it's like imagine some like knowing someone's in the car going we have to go it's just Whitney invited us and you know how she is and let's just leave the kids at home we'll just go for two hours I'd be like stay home with your kids well the stoic thing is it, the stoic rever- version of this would not be what are you going to think on your deathbed the stoics would say actually you're on your deathbed right now Ooh. first off because you could die at any moment but the other thing the stoics tell us is that we're dying all the time that's yes, right and so if you actually understand having children or your own life as a process of dying you're one years old and one day for one day mm-hmm. right that the person you are now like it, it's kind of a dark way to think about it but having kids is this constant process of loss but also gain mm-hmm. because who they were they're no longer but they're this new thing mm-hmm. and so as you're doing you're committing to other things you're gone too much you're working too much all this stuff it's not like, hey, in the future you're gonna regret this. Mm. Your, your future you're gonna feel like you're losing on you're losing out on something right now. Yeah, you have a finite amount of time, and you're choosing to do this other thing instead. And to understand also that this, I can't wait till they're walking. I can't wait till they're driving. Yeah. I, they, what you're also doing is fast forwarding through the thing that you want the most, right? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, and that's fascinating. And I, I don't know if this is pertinent or not, but the worm at the core by Ernest Becker about terror management theory helped me a little bit with in this area because it's sort of about how humans like we're. I mean, we're the only mammal that animal that knows it's going to die. So mm-hmm. we do all these things to manage our terror. You know, like we get obsessed with sports teams and we sure. make family crests yeah. and try to be immortal in all these ways. And it just made me realize all the ways that I kind of distract myself because it's hard to just be alone with myself sometimes and you know we talk about like our obsession with rome now and the bread and the circus and they're distracting us and i'm like yeah of course that's always happened but like what am i doing to just like jam pack my time so i don't have to sit with the fact that i'm slowly dying (laughs) yeah you're you're it's not just that you're slowly dying but that you're also fast forwarding it by thinking about what's next right like tomorrow or the next day or summer or Chris, like you're you're wishing through or rushing through your life, this thing that is going to go by very fast. And so there's this passage in Meditations where Mark Surrealist, who does in fact bury multiple children, like mm. he loses multiple children in, in a way that was gratuitous, even in that time, like where most people did it's like six or seven children, just From an like insane dysentery amount. dysentery or like? Just everything, diseases and plagues and injuries and accidents. It's just this grotesque, you know, series of tragedies for him. He says, though, in meditations, it's a line from Epictetus. He says, as you tuck your child in at night, tell yourself they may not make it through the morning. He's meditating on the mortality of his children. And why is he doing this? I don't think it's because he's going, you know, being attached is dangerous and so you detach and then you don't Mm. feel it when they die i think he's saying don't rush through bedtime like he's saying like bedtime is it this is the whole fucking thing enjoy this be here for this don't wake up tomorrow and this thing has happened and gone i'm sure i'm so glad i got back to that dinner party right like i i I think to myself as i'm like my son is not going to bed uh, as quickly as we would like. He's asking for one more story, making up that he needs a snack or whatever he's doing. I'm going like, I want this to be over. Mm-hmm. Someday it will be over. Not yeah. for good reasons. You're going to get it, your wish. Yeah. It, yeah. Someday it will be over for tragic reasons or it'll just be older because he's 11 and he doesn't want me in his room. You know what I mean? And so the idea that you're rushing through that, that you want it to be over for what? So I can check my email? So that's like, what the donkey's looking at you going, what are you doing? Like, mm-hmm. this is it. This, this is it. moment this is, is now. Yes. They're just like, you know, I mean, I sit in my horse's stall and we just sit there. I'm like, oh, this is so, uh, and like, we want. And like, I could do this all day. This is literally all I care about. Mm-hmm. And that's a wonderful, magical being it, but I do think it's hard for like high performers, ambitious sure. people to be relentlessly present, but that's it. That's like, that's where the magic is. Huh? And they need it the most to balance out the intensity that you have. You have to 
like maybe a regular person doesn't need to think about this, but we need it the most. But I think it's also good to do it with negative stuff too, because mm -hmm. you go like, oh, this great thing is going to be over soon, but so is this bad, hard thing. Sure, nothing lasts. Yeah, so, so it's just sort of like, this is painful, but it's like, it's all just temporary. Yeah, he's, meditations, Mark says something like, um, the pain will end or you will end, but one way or another, it will be over, <sighs> right? Like this thing, you're like, oh, my stomach hurts so bad. You're like, it's either going to kill me yeah, yeah, or, or, it's uh, not. or it's probably not. And so I'm going to just wait this out. Yeah. Should we call it? You tell me.